The story started with a scene at Rust Lake, Federal Waste Treatment Area Number 23. Salvager Li Yao, clad in tattered clothes and wielding a sword, pondered whether he had managed to catch it. Glancing at his essence watch, which was locked on, he hurried towards garbage ship number 1237, his thoughts drifting to the treasure hidden in the rubbish piles of the Upper East section. As he approached the ship, a group of people intercepted him, bickering over the same things as always. Li Yao spotted fellow salvager Fei Long and exchanged words, but he noticed the ship drifting away, leaving him little time to waste. He dashed past Fei Long, remarking on their perpetual competition in their profession, and launched an attack on one of the group members while making a beeline for the ship. Fei Long and his companions gave chase. His subordinate informed him that Li Yao had disappeared into the smoke from an earlier explosion. Ordering them to cease their actions, he remarked that Li Yao valued money more than his life, and if they were lucky, a mere spark would be enough. Just then, an explosion erupted in front of them. His lackeys were astonished to see that he had predicted this very well. Fei Long thought that with such a big explosion, Li Yao might have turned into ashes. Meanwhile, Li Yao wielded his black blade, unsheathed in his hand, though he hissed in pain, contemplating the bigger reward that would come with a bigger risk. Subsequently, he rushed toward the ships. Meanwhile, Fei Long waited for the energy to disperse. On the other side, Li Yao searched the ship and found something inside that astonished him. Ten minutes later, Fei Long and his companions appeared tired as the treasure was full of damaged goods. However, they were shocked to see Li Yao alive before them who greeted them. He commented on their sadness at his survival and commended their profession, recalling the last time he had snatched a processor from Fei Long. Later, he showed Fei Long the crystal processor, indicating he would give it back if they would let the matter go, while pointing out other salvagers approaching. He warned him that they wouldn't leave any loot for them. His lackeys urged him to teach Li Yao a lesson, but he silenced them, acknowledging Li Yao's cleverness. He ordered his subordinates to drop the matter and went to secure their loot. As they turned away, Li Yao, with teary eyes, resolved to retrieve the Dragon Class processor from them another time, knowing he had to leave as the Wild Wolf Class was less agreeable than Fei Long. Meanwhile, Fei Long's subordinates asked about his reason for not beating Li Yao. He told them to drop the matter as they didn't know about Li Yao's nickname. Then he elaborated that ten years ago in this graveyard of magical artifacts, there was one child facing a demon beast. The child wasn't scared of the beast and picked up a sword, challenging it to a fight. In the end, he defeated the beast and started eating its meat because he was hungry. His gaze was like that of a bloodthirsty vulture, fierce and determined. It was seen that after the dawn of cultivation, magic and technology entwined, magical artifacts gradually became common household items. At that time, the world entered into the grand age of cultivation. After a while, Li Yao stood in front of Morning Sun Village, contemplating his terrible luck and cursing Fei Long. He entered his home and sat down tiredly. He asked Black Blade to pour him some water and it complied. After drinking, he analyzed that he had almost gained nothing today. Then his blade asked to call him Papa, so he obliged and found a hologram projector inside the box. He was happy to find it because if he could fix it, he could eventually sell it at a good price and live comfortably for a while. He asked Black Blade to guess how much time it would take for him to repair it. It replied within 45 seconds, to which he responded that it underestimated him. Do you want to know the name of this manga, along with all the manga names of the recaps we did in our channel? How about also the chapter numbers our recaps end? You can simply ask the names in our Discord community for free or become a donor to get them all in one place. You can either be a donor in Patreon or be a member in our YouTube channel. Just scan this QR code or go to the link in the description to become a donor. Moreover, becoming a donor automatically makes you a VIP member of our Discord server with over tens of thousands of members. After a while, he had it repaired within 39.1 seconds. He started to give it a try and switched to the entertainment channel. Subsequently, a girl named Yingxi was shown on the stage in front of him, singing her new song called 40 Millennium of Cultivation. While she was singing, he asked Blackblade to guess the reason behind his likeness of Yingxi. However, he himself told the Blackblade that it was because both of them were orphans. He later added that he was lucky that his old man had adopted him. Not only this, but they also shared a dream. In a flashback, a young Li Yao was shown crying when someone approached him. When asked about his identity, he told Li Yao to call him father. He told Black Blade about his father's dream of becoming a master of artifacts. However, he had died, and Li Yao thought about his grave. He wondered if the dream his father had could accidentally come true. Later, someone was seen praising Li Yao while saying that now they understood why Li Yao was called Traceless Hand. With his method, his 2011 Mustang could go from 0 to 100 in 3 seconds, and not only this, but also within 1 minute and 59 seconds. They didn't even see his car because of its speed. Then he told him that Li Yao was the new racing lord. 
Then Li Yao was shown crying while someone asked for a promise from him to stop car racing. He also told him that he could become a good mechanic and no one would look down on him. They might even open their own car shop one day. Then someone begged him to race one last time for him as he owed someone a violent scar of 300 grand, and he was the only one who could race in 59 seconds. The scene changed, and Li Yao was shown in the hospital while someone begged the doctor to save him because of his young age. Suddenly, Li Yao woke up and thought about having the same dream again. He repeated the scenario of the dream in his mind, thinking that he was a mechanic and car racer in that dream. He thought about the continuous dreams in which he made new records and drove in that strange city. However, he got up and started to wear his uniform, thinking that no matter what he was yesterday, today he was a student at Federation Floating Spear City. Moreover, he was going to become a master of artifacts. Then he was going to exit his home while greeting Little Black. He then used the body art of the Spirit Serpent in order to run towards the school because he couldn't afford the cost of riding the school bus. It was seen that the sky of Floating Spear was filled with cultivation at dawn. Taking advantage of the transition from night to day, they meditated in order to absorb energy from the moon and sun. On his way to school, he also spotted Yingxi getting some nutrients. After a while, he had reached his school named Crimson Nimbus High School. He walked tiredly and reached Mr. Wang's second-hand shop. When Mr. Wang spotted him, he exclaimed that he was lucky that Li Yao had come here as he had lost two grand yesterday. While asking about the things Li Yao had brought for him, Li Yao rudely said that he wouldn't give him a discount. Then he showed him the projector, which surprised Mr. Wang. He offered him 9,500, which was quite a generous offer for Li Yao. He agreed to take 9,000 for it and left the remainder for Grandma Wang. When he turned back, Mr. Wang exclaimed that he had made millions in his days in a matter of minutes, so Li Yao shouldn't think highly of himself. He further added that Li Yao's college entrance exam was in a hundred days, so he shouldn't be so arrogant about his skills. Once he got into college, he would know his worth. At that, Li Yao retorted back that he was going to test into a good college. Meanwhile, a professor was meticulously calculating time on his watch, and Li Yao ran past him while thinking about the air of the school. There was a board reminding them that they had 99 days, 18 hours, and 7 minutes to get into college. While on his way to school, he thought that the top students of his school were already standing out. He aimed to get into one of nine elite universities in order to become a cultivator and stand at the top of humanity. There was an announcement for the students to proceed to the field behind the school and make a queue to go into their class. He was puzzled to hear that announcement and wondered if something had happened. Then someone addressed Li Yao with the name of Little Devil. He told him that some big celebrity might come here. Li Yao retorted that he felt something was off since morning. However, the boy consoled him by saying that even Bald Man Zhao had come here to greet that celebrity. Li Yao thought that the person must be of high importance. Then Meng had informed him that the celebrity would be fiendish blade, Peng Hai. After being informed, he turned to Li Yao and found him crying. Li Yao said Peng Hai was his idol. He further explained that Peng Hai was born in a slum, but was very talented from a young age. When he was 11, the school asked him to join. At 12, his spirit actualization quotient was 100%, so he became a cultivator with a high-quality spirit root. When he was 13, he got into the Institution of War, which is a top university. When he graduated, he was very skilled, reaching the 10th rank of the refinement stage. Then he joined the Federal Army and fought many fiendish beasts. People started calling him Fiendish Blade. When he was 22, he became the youngest cultivator to reach the foundation stage. After his retirement from the military, he went back to his hometown. While waiting in line, Li Yao's friends speculated that Peng Hai might marry a beautiful girl because he was always successful. They also mentioned Peng Hai's high salary for joining the Crimson Nimbus Guild, in just three years, he became the manager of the Crimson Nimbus Transportation Group, which specialized in creating new routes through dangerous areas infested with beasts. He also received dividends from this group, which helped him earn a fortune. Someone excitedly added that he also spent 70 to 80 million on a seasonal mansion where he entertained dozens of women. Li Yao expressed his envy of Peng Hai, as he had gone from being a poor slum dweller to the manager of a powerful faction, enjoying wealth, fame, and women. While waiting for Peng Hai's arrival in line, Li Yao promised himself that he would reach the same level of success one day. Finally, a car arrived behind them, and everyone was excited to meet Peng Hai. There was murmuring in the crowd as they saw Peng Hai's car, called the Mystic Warbird, the Federation's most advanced car, with power equal to that of powerful cultivators. With the power of that car, one could easily drive through the dangerous wasteland without any worry. Then Peng Hai emerged from the car, causing a commotion in the crowd, which earned a reprimand from the professor for staying in their place. Peng Hai was greeted by Bald Man Zhao, who apologized for their less-than-stellar welcome. Peng Hai shrugged it off and asked about his business there. Zhao replied that he needed to train the important class of students there. Meanwhile, 
Li Yao observed that even Zhao was cautious while talking to Peng Hai. Moreover, most universities didn't emphasize cultivation training because even though students could be naturally talented in this aspect, the chance of them becoming cultivators was almost non-existent. While looking at Peng Hai, he thought there was a huge difference between him and the world of cultivators. Cultivators were born talented and favored by heaven. Not only this, even his common class had a huge distance from the top class of the school. Then Zhao came in front of the desk and announced Peng Hai would be giving training to the top class of their school. Someone among the students remarked that Peng Hai was here to reverse the decline of their school. Meanwhile, Zhao added that he was going to manage the course for the top performing class, so the remaining students should go to their classes and resume their studies, as the entrance exams were less than a hundred days away. On the other hand, students of the common class, while looking at the snobbish faces of the important class, thought that the training was of no use to them. Moreover, the top class was looking down at them, while they came from important families, which could be seen in the quality of their uniforms. Afterwards, Peng Hai was seen among the top class students. Li Yao's classmate commented on the girl's behavior towards Peng Hai, which annoyed him. On their way to class, his classmate consoled him, saying Li Yao didn't need to stay angry because they were born like this. Then Li Yao turned to him with teary eyes, remarking about them being losers. Both of them started crying. A girl saw them and reminded Li Yao they were late for class. He replied that he just wanted to see the end of the universe at that moment, which aggravated her. While they were talking about the end of the universe, their teacher told them they were late by three minutes. She warned them about their expected punishment if they were late again. They entered the simulation where they were given 10 seconds. Meanwhile, their teacher offered to answer one question. While they were in the simulation, their teacher told them they were losers because they always complained. She mentioned not being able to help change their fate, but shared a quote to encourage them, saying they needed to be sharpened before going into battle. Meanwhile, in the simulation, the race was about to start. After a while, they found themselves in the great illusionary land called Chiuluo Desert. Li Yao came out from the simulation. It was the official mock exam, in which he was instructed to proceed within the given time. He was going to run 50 kilometers, arrogantly thinking he was someone who never took the school bus. Afterwards, he started to race, complimenting himself on looking handsome in his outfit. While running, he sensed a bulging floor and heard a strange sound. Suddenly, a beast appeared behind him and he started running faster. The beast was a two-headed desert wolf, larger than any normal wolf. It was a highly intelligent beast that ambushed its prey from below the sand. He thought that although it was difficult to defeat that beast, it was not impossible for him. He planned to attack it while it was still half buried in the sand. Employing the dire bear stance, he lunged at the wolf. However, the wolf retaliated, but he dodged its attack with the body art spirit serpent technique. With full speed, Li Yao rushed towards the wolf and attacked it with his steel claw technique. After defeating it, his score was shown as 13270. He was pleased to have mastered all of the basic skills of the 13 forces of the war beast. After tallying the points, he began collecting the resources, which included the bones and meat of the beast. He also filled his bag with wolf blood for protection. Later, he was shown taking theory exams, pondering how to solve them. The questions covered various topics, including math and medicine. He believed he should set higher expectations for the mock college entrance exam while mentally formulating his answers. As he contemplated one question, another student approached and answered it. Then he pondered a math question, finding it much easier. Before he could respond, he sensed a beast nearby and prepared to fight it. Meanwhile, a group of teachers discussed the campus being empty. Each classroom was filled with dozens of testing chambers where students engaged in mock exams, battling beasts and answering questions. Someone commented on Li Yao's skills, while others mentioned a student named Si Jiaxue, who had answered the final question. Meanwhile, Li Yao realized that only half an hour remained to complete the exam. After defeating numerous monsters, he wondered whether it was over or not. However, then the final question appeared in front of them. The question was about the definition of the Great Dark Age, and he pondered where to start. He thought about the Great Dark Age as an important period in civilization because it divided civilization into two periods, classical and modern. He began to answer the question about the cultivators who sought eternal life, creating an unrivaled civilization filled with glory. They pursued immortality and attempted to surpass the limits of life. However, at the peak of the cultivator civilization, they created worlds beyond worlds and delved into the mysteries of time. As their civilization evolved, ancient cultivators became more powerful, extending their lifespans and accumulating resources. The number of high-stage cultivators increased exponentially, along with their demands for resources. This led to civil war among high-stage cultivators over limited resources, resulting in 3,000 years of war, the destruction of many stars and crystal ships, 
and the devastation of planets and the fall of many immortal cultivators. This resulted in the destruction of 70% of their worlds, with most low-level cultivators fleeing. Afterwards, it seemed like the war was about to end, but the cultivator from an unknown world had invented a small, playful invention. However, with the passage of time, his name and his method of invention were being lost, but his invention was named as Feigned Lord Virus, as this virus turned the docile spirit beasts into terrifying killing machines. These killing machines were used for war, and they didn't tire or stop. They were even immortal. With his best army, this cultivator had invented an army of a hundred million stronger feigned beasts and unified the world in ten years. However, other cultivators had realized his method and started to make their own beasts. In this way, in a hundred years' time, cultivators had seen to use fiend beasts for war purposes. However, they had ignored two main points. First, the virus was contagious and had powerful self-replication ability. Second, with the passage of time, these beasts had developed their own intelligence which led to the feigned race. Thus, on the final day of the 3,000 years of the war, the feigned race had been awakened. They had started to extinguish the world and hunt for the cultivators who once ruled this world in the following hundred years. Those cultivators tried to hide in the cracks of stars and regions of space-time with the terror of those beasts. The next 30,000 years were called the Great Dark Ages of Mankind, in which the feigned race had been developed. In this race, all of mankind became the lowly slaves in which they had lost their basic rights, including the rights to cultivate. Meanwhile, those cultivators yearned for their days of glory, as most of those people were the descendants of the immortal cultivator. They were producing the new generation through primitive reproduction. However, the feigned race had ended due to the internal power struggle within the feigned race. After mankind was given the opportunity to strike, three cultivation revolutions were launched by talented cultivators. They also set up a modern cultivation civilization system, which was totally different from the ancient cultivator system, to ensure their path of glory. Under the rule of the Supreme Emperor, they had found remaining cultivators and formed 20 guilds of providence. After that, they had finally started to rule the world and found a way to avoid annihilation for modern cultivators. With that, he ended the answer because he was running out of time. The present period of their time was the greatest period of cultivation, called 40 millenniums of cultivation. Finally, the exam was over, and he came out of the simulation. The students were talking about their headaches. One of them said that it was because they were using the old simulation. On the other hand, the top was using the next generation testing chamber, which didn't have any side effects. Meng asked Li Yao about his exam. Meng further commented that he was going to fail and had a feeling he would go back home. Li Yao said that his exam was okay. However, when he checked Li Yao's scores, he was shocked to find that it was 525, which was enough for him to admit to any mainline university. However, he was even more shocked to see that Li Yao's actualization quotient was only 30%, which was quite low. At that, he asked about Li Yao's further plans, as the average university commonly didn't care about actualization quotient, even if it was 1%, because it dealt with normal people. However, the nine elite universities were going to multiply his test score with the percentage of actualization quotient for the final score. In this way, if the top class student would have a 400 score with a 60% actualization quotient, they would score better than him. At that, Li Yao commented that a higher actualization quotient described higher intelligence and sharp senses. It meant the top class was bound to score higher than them. He also explained that it didn't mean he didn't try to enhance his actualization quotient, but he couldn't because he didn't have many resources. He also commented that he didn't have enough money for food, so how could he afford those resources? Then they looked at the screen and were shocked to see that both CG Axue and Helian Lee had scored the highest in the mock exam. Their scores were 691, with 72 and 71% actualization quotient respectively. The scores had surpassed Li Yao. Meng commented about both of them being elites of the school and from powerful families. It also seemed that they could easily get into one of the nine elite universities. He also commented that the school went out of their way to convince Peng Hai to train them, to which they might have other motives. The school expected them to be the highest scoring winner in the entrance exams out of the whole floating spear city, or at least to come in the top ten. He continued with self-pity that life was unfair, as they were going to the top university and would lead a luxurious life of cultivators, while the students of the common class would be salaried laborers. At that, Li Yao tried to shut up Meng. Meng accused him of falling for Si Jia Shui, but told him that she was going to be betrothed to Helian Li. They also discussed Helian being the martial artist, and Si Jia Shui having the cold personality. Then why would he like such a girl? After class ended, Meng offered him lunch at a nearby pancake stall, claiming the owner could make an amazing hover-graved Verizon Crimson Flame omelet. However, Li Yao declined his offer, saying that he had work to do, and he would treat Meng tomorrow. 
After a while, when he entered a class, he sensed a fragrant smell and found Siji Akshue waiting for him there. She commented about him being late for 55 seconds. Li Yao reasoned that the place was hard to find and asked about the goods. She told him about a crystal processor unit which was damaged. She went to many shops in order to get it repaired, but they told her that it was too old to be repaired. She heard about his skill with the crystal processor and asked whether he could fix it. She added that she would give him anything he wanted for the repair, but if he couldn't do it, he should tell her now because she didn't want him to mess with its components. At that, he asked to look at it first. He switched it on and remarked about its splendor. He started to explain that this processor was Heavenly Zither's Sectube type CPU. It was developed by Vast Tomb 7 140 years ago. He added further that this type of CPU was soon replaced with chip type CPU, while its company existed for only 50 years, because the company had relied on the previous generation technology instead of advancing their processors. During the popularity of chip type CPU, that company staked everything and developed Vast Tomb 7 after utilizing all of their resources for the research of the aforementioned CPU. However, this led to their bankruptcy. Following that, she commented that it meant Vast Tomb 7 was the last version of the tube type crystal processor. He remarked that, however, it was a masterpiece in its own way. Then he turned to her and explained that the processor had a heatsink problem which increased the temperature of the processor while it was being used. He continued, saying that modern processors were being developed to be more powerful, so this processor was also increasing in heat. Thus, this crystal processor, which was a hundred years old, had difficulty in keeping such a large amount of data. At that, she informed him that this processor was left by her close relative, so it was important to her. She was willing to pay any price for its repair. Lee informed her that a heat sink issue was a common malfunction, but it was hard to repair due to the lack of its parts available in the market, as it was no longer being produced. However, he had some antique heat sinks within his collection. In other words, he could find suitable components for her processor. At that, she asked for his price. After some calculation and cutting a 5% discount for his fellow student, he decided to give her the price of 98500 which angered her. At that, she commented that she might have money, but she couldn't be scammed. He responded that he knew that the price was higher compared to the repair of a normal processor. But his processor was a hundred years old, so it should be considered an antique already. However, to sense her rage, he timidly reasoned that he was telling her a suitable price for the repair of an antique processor. Besides, the heatsink he had also collected for many years. He wouldn't try to scam her. However, when her mood didn't change, he wondered whether the reason behind her pressure was because of her 70% actualization quotient. He nonchalantly told her that if she thought he was expensive, she could apply for a free quote by sending it to the crystal processor shop where they could find a similar model within three to five months. Following that, she commented that the maintenance shop said the same thing, that fixing it was not the problem, but finding a suitable heatsink was. Then she offered him one lakh, but wanted it to be fixed by tomorrow. She added her condition that it should look as new and be stable for future processing because she wouldn't be paying any follow-up fees. In response, he replied that after its heatsink was replaced, it would work for three or more years, to which she agreed. After leaving the school, he happily claimed that he was going to buy strengthening drugs from the underground ghost city with this one lack. This was his only shot for getting into one of the nine elite universities. While checking the crystal processor, he thought that even though she was the diva of the school, he had no choice but to scam her for which he was sorry. The drug was going to last for three months, which was enough for him to temper his spirit and be reborn during the 100-day sprint examination. However, after school on his way back, he was approached by Helian Lee, who asked whether he was with CG Akshue a while ago. He was scared to see him in front of him as he thought he was done for. But Helian Lee told him that he knew it was impossible for both of them to have anything going on between them. He was going to let him go this time. Because they were aiming to be high scorers of the city, he didn't want to be distracted by trash like him. At that, Li Yao was angry that he called him trash. Healy and Lee said that he wasn't targeting him specifically. However, they saw all of the common class as trash. He thought that if a person had looks, fame, money, and talent, did it make him this conceited? After a while, he was watching a concert of a poor boy singing a song about one's dream. The following night, Li Yao had a dream about Heli and Lai taunting him for not having a shoe. While he showed him his branded shoes with high quality and finish, which cost 20 million yuan. When he woke up and looked at his shoes, he thought that there would be numbers of students like Heli and Lai at the entrance exams, and what did he think he was? Because of the unfairness of this world, he went outside to get some fresh air. While he was walking on the street, he suddenly found someone near the crystal train. He thought that the high-speed crystal train usually ran a dozen meters above the ground. He didn't understand how that person managed to get there. He shouted for that person to get down, otherwise he would be killed. Meanwhile, he sensed his presence to be strong. However, the man kept smiling and was tackled by the train. 
He thought someone would be insane to do something like this. After that, he was going to leave from there as the military was going to come there soon. Suddenly, before he could leave, the man's spirit came inside him, and he started to feel cold. He rushed to his home and fell on the floor. He asked for his black blade to help him and get him some medicine. After a while, he woke up in a strange place and found a number of hulky men in front of him. He wondered whether it was some bodybuilder association. However, suddenly he felt a needle-like stubble at his chin. A man shouted at the people around him that they were lucky to get admitted to the Hundred Smelting Guild. While he told them about the number of work they had to do for the food, they were having at the end of the day. He added that the most important thing they were going to do was to cultivate the Smelting Guild Foundation technique. For this, they needed to swing their hammer 10,000 times a day until the hole was hammered in this pure, auriculum smelted floor. When it would be done, they would be promoted to metal forge workers and would be able to cultivate more advanced techniques. Then suddenly, that man noticed Li Yao's presence standing there and called himself Wu Yeming. The person called Titan said that he had heard that Wu Yeming was claiming yesterday that he was going to be the leader of the guild one day. He angrily asked whether Wu Yeming thought that the hammer technique was too basic for the future leader of the guild. Then he was going to show him the 108-hand Chaos Gale hammer technique while swinging his hammer at him. At that, Wu Yeming was scared, while Li Yao didn't understand what was going on. After a while, Li Yao was standing in front of the mirror with his new persona and thought whether he was Wu Yeming or Li Yao. He was the lowly worker of the Hundred Smelting Guild who repeated the same thing on a daily basis. He also sensed that time was passing slowly there. Suddenly, Titan again started to beat him and warned him that he was going to use his technique on him again. However, the person was repeatedly beating him while telling him he was wrong. It affected his mind, and he wondered whether it was a dream he wasn't going to wake up from. After ten years, Uya Ming was standing as the most outstanding low-level worker of the Hundred Smelting Guild. By that time, he even mastered the 108 Hands Chaos Galehammer technique, he was also respected as a low-level worker and called Big Brother. After 11 years, he became the second-rank metal forge worker at the guild, which earned him the right to entry into the metal forging room. At year 14, he became an outer disciple of the guild, which earned him the title of blacksmith. At that time, he was allowed to assist in forging lower-grade flying swords used by outer disciples. At year 21, he was called a master craftsman and had his own furnace to forge lower-grade flying swords on his own. At year 29, he became a Grandmaster Craftsman who had outshined every Outer Disciples. At year 31, demonic cultivators invaded. During that battle, he took charge and killed 24 Building Foundation stage members of the demonic cultivators. It was then he had turned his 108 hands technique into the 189 hand technique. At year 33, he paid his respects to the Elder of the Guild, thus becoming an Inner Disciple. In the following three years, he became a core member and attendant to the Metal Forging Room. At year 38, he finally made a name for himself and was started to be called Senior Master Aoyu Ye by the youth of the guild because he was the only one who reached the peak from the bottom. The next year, he got married to the only daughter of the 35th guild master. While his wife was talking to him, suddenly her face started to change into someone else's. The girl started to ask for a promise from Li Yao not to go for car racing and become a mechanic as one day he could open his own S4 car shop. When she uttered his name, he suddenly realized that he was not Wu Yeming, but Li Yao. He wondered whether he was experiencing someone else's life. He further realized that if he had spent more time in that dream, then he might have woken up as Wu Yeming. He wondered the reason behind why he hadn't woken up yet, whether he needed to witness his life in a lucid dream. At year 41, Wu Yeming had become the youngest elder in the guild. It was the same year when he had forged a secret sword called Profound Spark, with which he had killed demonic cultivators who had seized the core formation stage of Great Monarch DeLong. At year 43, he was the representative of the guild for the Ten World Sword Theory competition. He surpassed the great heroes of the competition using the 100-meter Swallowing Dragon. During that time, he had earned the title of Blade Saint of the Ten Worlds after slaying the weapons of 92 opponents. Now he had the power to shake dozens of worlds as the Master Swordsman. After one year, the demonic cult had invaded, and his guild was one of their main targets, which resulted in the fall of guild elders and leaders one by one. With this situation, he became the 36th leader of the guild, and he had vowed to seek revenge on the holy ground of the guild, called the Ancient Land of Ten Thousand Swords. In the following years, he had forged great divine weapons that stunned the world. It resulted in the massacre of the last disciple of the divine guild by him with his new weapon at year 63. After that, he was called Uyezi with the greatest respect. At year 109, his name had spread across the hundred worlds, and people from another world traveled hundreds of kilometers just to acquire the weapon he had forged. 
After many years, in the year 320, Wu Yeming wanted to time travel. However, his subordinate wanted to stop him from this absurd idea. However, he wanted to explore the mysteries of time in order to find the meaning of cultivation. He had finally forged a great time array in which one could traverse through time. He said that even though the possibility was minimal, he wanted to check if time travel was possible at all. He told his disciples that he had no regrets, as he had studied each artifact of this world. Now he hoped to see new artifacts far away in the future, after millennia of years. However, when he was traveling, there was a problem with the array, and everyone was going to escape. However, he ordered everyone to use their strongest artifact to withstand it, because it was impossible to escape that time. Suddenly, Li Yao woke up on his bed, and asked his black blade whether it was the one who brought him to bed. Afterward, suddenly he was having a severe headache and there were lights coming out from his body. He tried to capture it. Afterwards, he noticed that his ceiling had 327 cracks. He also noticed his teacup in which over a hundred words were engraved. It was a war poem by the poet from 133 years ago. Now he could see the poet's life and the success of his military campaign in front of his eyes. He didn't understand how he knew that. Now suddenly he also remembered the time of the 30th of May three years ago very vividly and with every detail. He even remembered the personal life of his neighbor. He didn't understand the reason behind him thinking about those random things in such detail. He thought it looked like he had become a cultivator. He suddenly reminded himself about the dream and understood that the pain could help him to concentrate better. He opened his crystal processor and searched for the Hundred Smelting Guild. He got wind of the guild and the 36th leader of the guild, who was Wu Yeming. He was a model artisan who was a renowned travel master craftsman often mentioned in ancient scripts and records. The records also mention the mysterious disappearance of the Hundred Smelting Guild around 46,000 years ago within a huge explosion. Moreover, according to the unearthed written report, Wu Yeming somehow had forged a transmission array which could travel through time. During the first experiment, he unintentionally had triggered a huge energy essence explosion which caused his consciousness to scatter. But the thing was that the slightest remnants of the guild's record could not be recovered. The information they had was from ancient scripts because of the classified nature of guild records. Therefore, the reason behind the death of Uyezi and the extinction of the Hundred Smelting Guild was unknown. After reading the research, Li Yao concluded that the Hundred Smelting Guild was an ancient sect, and Wu Yeming was the master craftsman who somehow invented a device to travel through time, an experiment that also triggered the explosion and led to the destruction of the guild. However, the guild went into extinction, but Wu Yeming somehow traveled through time and reached the 40,000th era of cultivation. Wu Yezi, being a crafting maniac, was eager to inspect a high-speed crystal train but was killed by it. Afterwards, his invincible spirit couldn't be broken, and he tried to possess Li Yao because Li Yao was passing by at that time. After concluding everything, he didn't understand how he could resist the possession of someone like Wu Yezi, as Li Yao was only a normal human being. He further thought that Wu Yeming shouldn't have any problem possessing him with his mental strength. But it was different for him, because his mental depth had already possessed memories which weren't his. They were the memories of Li Yao from Earth. It was like a vaccine that made him immune from being possessed. Then he wondered how he understood everything so easily. Then he remembered his teacher once said that the highest realm of profound cultivation was entering into the extremely slow time flow rate. When someone entered this mysterious state of cultivation, a second in reality was like a year in the mental world. This was very beneficial for raising one's actualization quotient. He was excited to assume that he might enter into this mysterious state. Not only this, he might have been tempered with Wu Yeming's soul, which had increased his actualization quotient. He fell happily on his bed while wondering about the amount of actualization quotient he would have. He also wondered whether he would have the power to beat those arrogant students from the important class. The next day, he enthusiastically woke up with the spirit of beating the elite class. However, he fell down from the bed and asked for the mirror from his black blade, as he might be weakened. He was shocked to see himself as skinny in the mirror. He didn't understand why he didn't hear anything and there was no improvement in his abilities as well. He shouted for his black blade to bring him something to eat, and it brought him some canned food. He started to eat canned food with a ravenous appetite. Afterwards, he realized that he had eaten so much. Then he remembered the guild instructor instructing him to eat 100 kilograms of fish because the food was the only essence for them to absorb energy. They had also been taught to eat a whale for the sake of learning the art of eating, which would help them to absorb energy from the food. It was because, at the peak of cultivation, the strength of their digestive system would be improved by a hundred times, which would help them to digest a hundred kilograms of meat. Not only this, they could also absorb energy from the bones of the strongest spirit beasts. At that, he started to shout again that he was too hungry and instructed his black blade to bring some more food. After a while, when he finished eating a bunch of canned food, he said that he still had space to eat more. However, he got up and started to check his energy. 
His punching strength had increased by 15%, while his speed had increased by 20%. He thought that the great art of swallowing a whale had lived up to its name. However, he stopped while thinking that he didn't remember much of the technique of Wu Yeming. At that, he thought even if he could master only half of his secret technique, becoming a master craftsman would be a piece of cake. He excitedly thought that he would be an idol among the youth. He would have money, cars, and women which would gain him respect from everywhere. While he was laughing like a maniac, he got a message from CG Xue that he didn't come to school today. He had to repair the crystal processor for CG Xue, but suddenly he realized that he had slept for a day and night, and he was short of time to complete this work. He messaged her back that he was going to give it to her after one and a half hours. She replied back that there would be someone at his entrance after that time, and he could give the processor to him, to which he complied. He looked at the processor while thinking of a way to repair it hurriedly. However, he could see its blueprint in his mind. He excitedly thought that he didn't even need a heat sink now with his new ability. He thought that it was not difficult to see Wu Yeming develop this for a hundred years. He thought that he didn't remember Wu Yeming's technique, but his vision had improved. After a while, he changed the structure of the heat sink, which he thought was worth the money he was charging. Afterwards, he decided to use the remaining time to take a shower. After a while, he went to the hidden winter lakeside. He checked his surroundings and didn't find them bad. Following that, he found the same woman whom he had seen in his dreams, and she asked whether he was Li Yao from Crimson Nimbus School. He gave her the processor and asked whether she wanted to check. She declined his offer, saying that Si Jiak Shui had instructed her that she would do it herself and would find Li Yao if there were any problems. Then she gave him name card. He asked her to express his thanks to Si Jiak Shui and added that she could ask for his service in the future, as he would also give her a big discount. Suddenly, he smelled the meat and thought it smelled better than canned food. He was going to go inside but was stopped by the woman, yet he started to chant that he was so hungry. She informed him about their discount and price for the buffet. He thought he could buy lots of cans with this money. However, he came inside to relish the food. At that moment, he thought that he was overthinking, as he had recently earned one lakh, and one meal didn't make him poor at all. He gathered a bunch of food on his plate, to the astonishment of the people around him. Then he started to eat, which helped him to attain the twelfth level. Meanwhile, Si Jiak Shui and He Lian Liye were seen talking. He Lian Li asked for forgiveness from Si Jiak Shui because he had confronted Li Yao and the rumor spread, which resulted in the elders questioning Si Jiak Shui. She forgave him but asked him to drop the matter because she had the freedom to associate with whomever she wanted. He understood and asked her to get inside and have a drink for young Master Zheng's birthday. But she declined his offer by saying that she was tired and going back, which enraged him. Suddenly, he was complimented by young Master Zheng about his strong legs. Zheng Dongming, a third-generation member of the Zheng clan, which was supported by many strong and fearsome cultivators. He was also an elite student of Phoenix Ridge Guild Auxiliary High School. His actualization quotient was 74%. Not only this, he was named as the top scorer in Floating Spear City, and his strength was slightly higher than Healy and Lies. He consoled Healy and Li, saying he shouldn't submit to Si Jiak Shui just because her family was influential in the city. Healy and Li mentioned that Zheng didn't seem to understand his feelings for Si Jiak Shui, at that, Zhang jokingly said that he didn't understand the meaning of affection and offered him a drink, which raised laughter from the people. He irritably asked about the reason behind their laughter. They told him that there was a person who was eating like a hungry ghost, which was unsightly. He replied that if someone came here to eat, then they should go to a quieter place, but it shouldn't raise laughter. One of them explained that the person had finished off the long leg of meat in just three bites. Not only this, he had eaten a huge plate of deep-sea king crab, and his plate was cleaner than the scrubbed plate. He also ate 20 sea urchins in half a minute with their shells. Zhang replied in a bored tone that he didn't have time to go see a man eat while thinking about women. He asked Healy and Lai whether he wanted to witness, but Heli and Lai declined the offer. Then the person informed Healy and Lai that the person was wearing the uniform of Healy and Lee's school, which halted his step. Zhang commented that even Crimson Nimbus school was not of the standard of his school, but he didn't know such talent existed in his school. Helian responded that all the students of his school were elite, it was impossible for them to be so gluttonous. They decided to see whether it was true or not and came inside. They found Li Yao eating voraciously, which raised He Li and Li's temper. Zhang mocked He Li and Li, asking whether Li Yao belonged to his school. Helian rushed to Li Yao with rage and asked about his purpose for being there. Li Yao nonchalantly retorted that there was no need to explain. Meanwhile, he thought that he had seen plenty of powerful cultivators, so he didn't need to fear He Li and Li. Helian angrily rushed towards him, ready to attack. However, Li Yao's five senses awakened. With this, he could clearly see the expressions of the people around him within 0.1 seconds. He could clearly spot plants and leaves around him, 
smell the cooking in the kitchen, and even spot a cucumber thrown on the floor nearby. He masterfully dodged Helian's attack, which resulted in Helian falling into the dishes on the table and dirtying himself. It caused his friends to laugh at Helian. Jung said in a mocking tone that the spectacle in front of them was more interesting than anything, especially Helian's performance for his birthday. Another boy asked whether they should help Helian as he had mysophobia. Jung declined, saying that they would watch the show. However, he instructed him to call a spiritual crane because he thought that Li Yao was spunky. He further instructed them to fetch an emergency flying shuttle from their private house because Helion might explode. However, Helion was emitting negative energy. Meanwhile, Li Yao thought that he wasn't afraid of Helion. Before Helion could attack Li Yao, the manager held him back by saying that he was drunk. He further added that serving the people of Lakeside depended on their livelihood. If he wasn't drunk, then why would he attack a person the manager relied on for the living, especially in his presence? At that, he asked the manager whether he was threatening him. He said that he didn't dare to threaten him, he was just warning him. Then he pointed toward the reporter who was sitting in the cabin, saying that it would not be good for Helian's reputation if the reporter got his picture. At that, he looked irritatedly at Li Yao and left the place. Then the manager turned to Li Yao and apologized for the inconvenience. To compensate, he gave him free food for the night. Subsequently, Li Yao was happy to dig in more when Zheng approached him and introduced himself. He also added that he had seen everything. However, Li Yao nonchalantly expressed his disinterest. At that, Zheng showed a golden card to him while offering him his friendship because he could see Li Yao's talent. Li Yao asked about the card. Zheng answered that he didn't have a hidden agenda, but he wanted to introduce him to a professional insurance agent. Li Yao didn't understand his motives. Zheng explained that he should invest all of his savings in health insurance because he would need it tomorrow. On his way back home, Li Yao chuckled at the condition of Helian Lai. He thought that girls would be attracted to him after knowing that he had defeated Helian Lai, especially C. G. Akshue. However, he thought that if Helian Lai behaved well, he might forgive him. Suddenly, everyone saw a spirit around him, and he found himself standing in front of the lift without realizing how he got there. He thought about the exams and how he would surprise everyone by cultivating diligently. He thought about Helian Lai, who had called him trash, and wondered what his reaction would be if his score ended up higher than Helian's. As he opened the door of the lift, he saw various interconnected facilities underground, all tangled into a complex maze. They were stocked with a huge ration of food, clean water, and other necessities of life. With the help of essence energy, these goods were sealed to stay fresh until opened. The 40,000 years of cultivation were not peaceful. The conflict never ceased, and the Star Glory Federation was caught in war for a long time. Every cultivator hub had 10,000 shafts dug into the ground during their early construction, they also built refugee shelters, sewage systems, and ventilation shafts. It was for the worst cause if humanity needed to be underground, as the surface would be seized by fiend races. The supplies underground were enough for hundreds or thousands of people to survive for a decade. Moreover, the weapon supplies were enough to confront an army of hundreds of thousands. However, with the passage of time, people enjoyed their time on the surface during times of prosperity, and the underground fortress lost its purpose. Then the improvised people turned to the underground, where they thrived. People underground multiplied and flourished, calling it Peach Blossom. This place was declared a gray area, which is why it had its own atmosphere and unique order. After entering the underground ghost city, he started to have a snack. At that time, a woman addressed him and tried to sell jade slips to him. He declined the offer because he had already seen them. She tried to lure him by saying that those were high-definition versions refined by skilled cultivators, ten times more advanced than their normal counterparts. She also added that he could easily see individual hairs of the women with these jade slips. Besides, she said he wouldn't forget them and would want more after experiencing them. However, he walked straight while saying that he had some other business to attend to, leaving her astonished due to his speed. After a while, he stood in front of his destination. There were numbers of notes pasted on the wall, in which one offered the solution to any problem by an ex-soldier refinement stage cultivator. After a while, he finally found what he was looking for, an advertisement for various drugs and medicines at cheap prices with minor side effects. He checked the online reviews to understand the seller. After checking the reviews and other details, he concluded that the reviews were not bad. Besides, they had provided the legitimate address and contact number, which was often avoided by small sellers to avoid trouble. After checking further, he realized that their price was 5% higher than the other sellers, but the quality of the drugs was higher, made from original ingredients without side effects. He wondered whether it was the real thing or not. He started to write a message to the seller that he wanted a hundred proud heaven path, which was meant for students who were going to take exams. At that, he got the answer that he could get the medicine any time. He answered that he was coming there. He switched off his processor. 
Afterwards, he had written his own ad in which he offered his repairing services for any type of flying swords, refining artifacts and flying shuttles as a high-ranking master artificer. After writing it, he felt satisfied, thinking that he might catch a big fish while pretending to be a retired artificer. Then he got a patterned mask glyph and wore it. It hurt at first, but then he looked at the mirror and thought that even Mung wouldn't recognize him with it. While walking towards his destination, he thought that in the underground ghost city, there were a number of criminals mixed with civilians. It was his first time dealing with this drug dealer, so he should be cautious and mask his identity. He set the alarm on his essence watch as the mask effect would last for dozens of hours, which would be enough for him to get over with it. After a while, he arrived at the destination and pinched his nose, wondering if the place was a cultivation gym. Afterwards, a man wearing a mask explained that the Star Glory Federation encouraged a military spirit within their culture, and cultivators enjoyed paramount statuses. Members of the Federation would try everything on the path of cultivation. Even if they failed as cultivators, they could still build their physique and enhance their strength. Consequently, almost every street held fitness centers, cultivation gyms, and martial arts schools. However, these centers didn't cater to fearsome cultivators, but usually to students and normal workers. Then he looked at the board, which read, Militant Wolf Slayer. After reading it, he concluded that the drugs were made only for the cultivation gym members because their purpose was not earning money. That was the reason the quality was up to par and the results were guaranteed. He went inside and observed his surroundings. Suddenly, someone mistakenly punched him. The man apologized to Li Yao, who shrugged it off and asked about the whereabouts of Chef Zhao. In another scene, a man was shown in front of Peng Hai. Peng Hai called the man instructor and talked about their memorable battle in the wasteland against fiendish beasts. Then they toasted, and Peng Hai complimented the taste of wine. The instructor told him that he didn't need to come here often, even if he placed great value on their relationship. Besides, this place was for amateurs, but he was a foundation-level cultivator. Peng Hai tried to persuade him, mentioning the dangerous situations they had faced together. He even took a hit for Peng Hai during Operation Razor Edge. The instructor revealed that he had not only lost his arm, but also that the hit had damaged 70% of his heart, resulting in him falling from the 13th refinement stage. Afterwards, he had become a military-grade dude due to having no choice. The instructor consoled him, saying that the path of cultivation was filled with danger, and he had no choice but to live on the edge. Besides, he didn't fear death as well. Peng Hai complimented him, calling him the man with a body of steel who had seen the ups and downs of life. He added that the instructor was wrong about one thing, as coming there was not a waste of his time. Instead, it helped him to cultivate. The instructor asked about the reason behind his statement. Peng Hai explained that his essence, however, was higher than the stage of foundation but unstable. Consequently, in a drastic situation, it dropped to the middle level of the foundation stage, which sometimes cost him his life. The reason behind it was the rapid rise of strength, which made him unstable to control. The instructor asked about his plan to solve this problem. Peng Hai explained that he had reduced his strength to 3% and came here for intense training. The instructor commented that this was the reason why he couldn't sense Peng Hai's cultivator aura, as he was using only 3% of his power. Peng Hai informed him about his target, which was to train intensely while suppressing his power to 1%. This was his method to reach the border of the foundation stage apex. He added that his unstable control of his power was his weakness, and he didn't want anyone to find out. This was the reason for his coming here because he only trusted two people, and one of them was the instructor. Finally, he commented arrogantly that unfortunately, the members of his gym were so weak that they couldn't endure training with him, even when he was only using 3% of his strength. The instructor clarified that the members were not professional martial artists, so it was obvious that they didn't stand a chance against even with 3% of his strength. However, as Peng Hai wanted to spar with a stronger opponent, he had called a renowned gold medalist to spar with him who would arrive shortly. Peng Hai asked whether he was stronger. The instructor informed him that he hadn't met him personally, but that person had mingled with the underground world for many years and earned himself the nickname Iron Turtle because of his tough defense. Therefore, he might be able to tackle Peng Hai's 3% strength attack. Meanwhile, they saw Li Yao from the glass door, and the instructor assumed that he was that gold medalist person and informed Peng Hai about it. Afterwards, Li Yao came inside with the gym members. The gym members informed Zhao that he wanted to meet up with him. Zhao asked whether he had any problem with the price they had discussed before. Li Yao answered that he didn't have any problem and wanted to get the transaction over with. After that, he instructed Li Yao to follow him, and he did so. Afterwards, he led him to the room and handed him clothes. He then told him that he needed to endure for three or more minutes in order to receive 10,000 credits. Otherwise, he wouldn't get anything, which confused Li Yao. He understood that he was being mistaken for someone else. 
Zhao added that he heard Li Yao came from the martial arts school and was being a sparring partner. He asked whether the conditions he had told earlier worked for Li Yao. Meanwhile, Li Yao thought that he didn't know a sparring partner could make so much. He further thought that he worked to death in the artifact graveyard in order to make only 18,000 credits monthly. However, he had received 100,000 credits from Si Jiaxue, but there were few chances he could get. Now he was offered 10,000 credits just for three minutes. How could he let down this offer? Zhao asked whether he was ready. Li Yao thought about the greater change his body strength had gone through. Besides, the gym members were mostly amateurs, so it would be a piece of cake for him. He then looked at Peng Hai wearing a mask and doing the fifth sequence exercise. He thought that it was taught in elementary school, while Peng Hai was using it for the warm-up, which questioned Li Yao about his strength. He thought that these 10,000 credits were almost for free. Then he started to wear the uniform and asked Zhao whether he needed to only take hits but not hit back. Zhao answered that he could attack back if he would like, but he doubted that he could do it, so he advised him to withstand his opponent's attack. Then he left this place, while promising to see him after three minutes. While standing on the ground, Li Yao thought that he was fighting with only the amateur, so they didn't need to give him such safety gear. He looked at Peng Hai, who had shifted to the fourth great stretch in the sixth chest expansion. He thought he had left five movements. Then he approached Peng Hai and asked whether he needed to complete the sequence. Peng Hai retorted, asking whether Li Yao didn't need a warm-up. At that, Li Yao arrogantly commented that he didn't need it in battle. Peng Hai agreed to start the battle, and his three minutes started. Li Yao was shocked to see that he didn't see Peng Hai because of his speed. Suddenly, he was struck on his chest with something. Afterwards, he was seen with several injuries. He thought that he couldn't even see whether Peng Hai was attacking him with his fist or foot. Now he understood the strength of his opponent, and wondered if the person was from there, as there would be many people who could make 10,000 credits in three minutes. Meanwhile, only five seconds had passed. Peng Hai commented about Li Yao's defensive power being weaker, so he asked if they could call it off. Li Yao answered that he just wasn't ready. He thought about the price of 10,000 credits just for three minutes. He thought that he was known for the vulture in the artifact graveyard who valued money more than his life, so how could he leave such an amount of money? He challenged Peng Hai, but when he moved, Li Yao still couldn't see him. Again, Peng Hai started to attack him, while he was bearing Peng Hai's attack and thinking about the strategy to see his attack. During that time, a memory of Wu Yezi resurfaced in his mind. When Wu Yeming was a low-level worker and was constantly attacked by Titan with the Iron Hammer, one of his companions offered to teach him the trick to see the Titan's attack for the sake of his part of the fish. He advised him to turn his head and use his peripheral vision to see his opponent's attack, because it was better at detecting movement. He then started to use peripheral vision and could see Pang Hai rushing towards him. He thought about the 10,000 credits and started to dodge his attack. Peng Hai was impressed that it took Li Yao only 59 seconds to see his attack. Li Yao asked whether he wanted to know his method for seeing him, which his master had told him 20 years ago on a dark and stormy night. However, Peng Hai declined it. Meanwhile, Zhao was seen having dinner when someone entered behind him, to whom he asked about his identity. On the other hand, only 30 seconds were left, and Li Yao endured Peng Hai's 620 hits during that time while thinking of not giving up. Suddenly, he realized one strategy of Peng Hai that whenever he attacked Li Yao from the right side, he bent his left leg a bit more. He decided this to take advantage of it while attacking him back. Meanwhile, with Zhao, the incoming man seemed to be the real Iron Turtle, which startled Zhao because he wondered if he was the Iron Turtle, then who was Li Yao? He rushed inside, and only one second was left. Meanwhile, Li Yao somehow managed to attack Peng Hai with the Chaos Gale Hammer technique, striking him 94 times with a murderous hammer tornado. Zhao shouted for Peng Hai to show Li Yao mercy. However, Li Yao thought it was for him and believed that Peng Hai couldn't just beat him for free. With his attack, Peng Hai's mask cracked a bit, but Li Yao's fist backfired on him, knocking him down. Zhao asked about Li Yao's well-being. Peng Hai checked his pulse and informed Zhao that he had just passed out and would be better with a strength-replenishing drug. Then he complimented Li Yao's strength, which pushed him to his baseline, indicating he had used 4% of his strength. Afterwards, Li Yao was in a recovery pod for recovery, while Peng Hai and Zhao were standing in front of him. Peng Hai commented that Li Yao was truly a gold medalist, who not only endured his attacks for three minutes, but also counterattacked at the end, pushing him to use 1% more of his strength. Then he turned to Zhao and commented that he was worth his money, and he'd like to spar with him for another three minutes the following night. Zhao sheepishly explained that Li Yao was not that gold medalist. Peng Hai assumed that he was from Zhao's gym then. At that, he informed him that Li Yao might be from his school. Afterwards, Zhao showed him Li Yao's uniform. Peng Hai checked the uniform and concentrated, thinking that he had sensed experience behind Li Yao's moves during their battle. 
Besides, his last moves showed the type of ferocity as if he had passed through a mountain of corpses to reach that level. He wondered that although he had seen many talented individuals in his school, he couldn't find someone with real experience like Li Yao had. He wondered whether Li Yao was a freshly graduated elite. Zhao asked whether he would like him to wipe the spider pattern from Li Yao's face to know his identity. However, Peng Hai declined, saying that he did it because he wanted to disguise his identity, so they should wait for him to wake up for further inquiry. Zhao wondered how much time Li Yao would take to wake up, as the average person would be awake after an hour, but he was still sleeping after one and a half hours. Meanwhile, the color of the water in the recovery pod dulled down from blue to cayenne and finally turned translucent. Zhao suddenly checked the machine and thought that the recovery drug was enough to help the severely injured man recover. Peng Hai commented that it seemed like Li Yao's body had been starved for too long, and now, with the strengthening pod, he started to absorb the drugs immediately. He further pondered that he didn't know Li Yao was starving when he sparred with him, and wondered about the results if he had his full strength. He then instructed Zhao to add his prescription drugs into the recovery pod. Zhao retorted that it would cost them a significant amount of money, as the single dose cost would be 50,000 credits, and Li Yao would need three to five doses a day to fully recover. Peng Hai agreed to pay the price, raising a protest from Zhao, but he interrupted Zhao, asking him to request Li Yao to spar with him for three minutes every night when he woke up. If Li Yao agreed, Peng Hai would sign a contract with him, providing 10,000 credits for each day in addition to the recovery cost. Zhao warned him that it would cost him 100,000 if he continued like this for a month. However, Peng Hai retorted that he had a feeling that sparring with Li Yao could help him reach the peak of the foundation building stage. He considered the 100,000 not a bad price, as he would need to hunt down a few high-level beasts to earn it back. He then wore his coat and turned to Zhao, informing him that he had transferred 5 million to Zhao's account for Li Yao's recovery. He also mentioned that he had a lecture with the top-class students of Crimson Nimbus High School and would like to spar with him tomorrow. Before leaving, he looked at Li Yao, expressing that he was looking forward to their three minutes. After a while, Li Yao was shown having a dream of combat with Peng Hai, and suddenly he woke up in the recovery pod, feeling great because he had acquired the full strength of his body. Zhao explained that it was because he was soaked in the strengthening drugs for five hours, which surprised him. Afterwards, Li Yao started to eat ravenously. Zhao asked whether he was a soldier because of his eating style, adding that consuming a larger amount of energy in a shorter time was a skill itself that helped soldiers survive. He speculated about Li Yao's background, wondering if he had undergone military training or had an elder who had been a high-ranking officer in the secret force. Later, Zhao showed Li Yao the contract Peng Hai had offered him, explaining the details of the contract without revealing Peng Hai's identity. Li Yao happily agreed to the offer. The next day, Li Yao was happy to earn a lot in one go. As he headed towards class, it was shown that there were 97 days left for the entrance exams. Meanwhile, Li Yao thought that it was his time to shine. Meanwhile, Meng asked about Li Yao's whereabouts the previous day. Li Yao nonchalantly informed him that he was sick and rested at home while tossing a parcel to him. Meng caught it and opened it, finding a whole piece of Li Yao's favorite treat inside the parcel. He asked Li Yao if he had hit the jackpot and how he was going to finish it. Li Yao answered that he should eat five while tossing five. While on their way, Meng asked if Li Yao had heard the earth-shattering news spreading around school, which piqued his interest. Meng explained that someone from the common class had fought Helian Lai and defeated him with a secret technique. As a result, Helian Li was reprimanded and punished to stay at home for a week by his elders. Meng admired the guts of the unknown guy, but assumed that he was going to meet a tragic end. At that, Li Yao asked if Helian Li was grounded at home, then suggested they watch a show. Meng replied that he underestimated Helian Li's influence at the school. He informed Li Yao that Helian Li's father was an influential member of the school board, and Helian Li himself was the student council president. Additionally, he had many talented students as his subordinates, making him virtually unbeatable. Meng also reminded Li Yao about the student who had dared to provoke Helian Li and was beaten by him as a result. Not only that, when the student was admitted to the hospital, he accidentally took the wrong medicine and fell into a coma for half a month. To make matters worse, he was expelled from the school after recovering. This information startled Li Yao, making him wonder about the extent of Helian Li's power. Unbeknownst to Li Yao, Meng continued, saying that if it weren't for Helian Li's influence, no one would fear him now, regardless of how good of a fighter he might be. He suggested that the person who provoked Helian Li should drop out of school to save himself. Then, Meng suddenly noticed Li Yao's pale face and commented on it. On the other hand, Li Yao played innocent. Meng also remarked on Li Yao's habit of eating six pancakes at once and noted his back being as hard as rock. Afterwards, they headed towards the gym. 
Crimson Nimbus High School had nine gyms, one of which was gymnasium number nine. It was the oldest, most outdated, and had a discouraging environment. Unfortunately, it was reserved for the common class to use for cultivation. Meanwhile, Li Yao entered the simulation and immersed himself in it. Afterwards, he pondered the upgrade of his actualization quotient, which would increase. Next, he found himself facing numerous beasts, ready to test his ultimate speed. The beasts rushed towards him simultaneously, attacking him constantly. However, he dodged every attack with incredible speed. Then he checked the time and was pleased to see that he had completed 1,000 kilometers in 1 minute and 32 seconds, 41 seconds faster than his previous record. He then wanted to test the limit of his jumping power. Afterwards, he was shown jumping at a fast speed, continuing like this for half an hour. After that, he checked his actualization quotient, which was at 58%. He was excited to see that he had improved 20% of his actualization quotient. Now, he was just one step behind cultivation geniuses of the elite class. Following that, he emerged from the simulation and noticed an old, dilapidated strength tester covered in dust. He smirked, thinking that with its intricate structure and layers, it could work for him. He further thought that while it was true he could do anything in this illusionary world, it couldn't replace hitting something real. Then he punched the machine and got a result of 355 pounds, which seemed lower to him. He thought he must be missing something. Then he plugged the earbuds in and started to hear the song of Yingxi while singing it alongside her. Then he punched the tester with all his might. Meanwhile, students at the gym sensed a terrifying and strange aura. Suddenly, they saw Wei Ti in front of them. Wei Ti was the school's second notorious tyrant, standing at a height of 2.1 meters and with a bodybuilder physique. Because of this, he was nicknamed Iron Beast. It was known that he had overdosed on strengthening drugs in his first years, which caused his body to enter a dysfunctional state. Consequently, his actualization quotient was affected, leading to his admission to the common class. However, his battle strength surpassed that of the elite class. Besides this, he had a brutal character, often picking on the weak, and when he went out of control, he didn't spare even his teachers as well. As he passed through the gym, everyone gave him a wide berth. He picked a student and brutally asked about Li Yao, to which the student expressed his lack of information. He caused trouble after that. Meanwhile, there were murmurs among the students about Li Yao being in trouble. Afterwards, a student informed him that Li Yao was having a stomach ache and had gone to the bathroom. Upon hearing this, he hit that student because he hadn't asked him about it. After that, he asked a female student about Li Yao, and she answered that she didn't know. Then he ordered her to ask others. Everyone was terrified of him. After a while, Li Yao was shown standing in front of him. Wei Ti informed him that he got 50,000 credits to break some of his bones. At that, he asked mockingly which bones Li Yao would like him to break. On the other hand, Li Yao was seen full of energy while enjoying the song. He had finally punched a worth of 1050 pounds. Afterwards, he asked about what Wei Ti had said while removing his earbuds, which startled him. However, he also noticed the test machine and checked the weight of his punch. He wondered what would happen to his body if it were hit by Li Yao's strong punch. Li Yao asked about his purpose in approaching him, which made him a little terrified. On the other hand, Li Yao wondered why, despite Wei Ti's notorious personality, they hadn't crossed paths before. Besides, he also sensed Wei Ti's strange behavior. Meanwhile, Wei Ti asked a favor from Li Yao, which was to exchange pointers to improve his punching. Li Yao politely declined, stating that he didn't have much time today but would do it tomorrow. Wei Ti turned away, saying he had no problem about Li Yao being busy, then left. After he left hurriedly, there were murmurs in the crowd. Someone suggested that Li Yao might have used some sort of hypnosis glyph on Wei Ti for him to behave like this. They discussed the strange behavior of Wei Tie, as he hadn't broken Li Yao's bones as he had threatened before. Meanwhile, Li Yao turned to Meng, who informed him about what Wei Ti had said, leaving him shocked. Meng informed him that the last person Wei Tie had exchanged punches with ended up with a broken leg. However, he also expressed curiosity about Wei Tie's sudden departure. Li Yao explained that he had informed Wei Tie that he was busy today, and Wei Tie had left. Suddenly, he noticed Meng vomiting blood and asked about it. However, he suddenly realized something and asked Meng to keep his distance from him for a few days because he now understood why Wei Ti was looking for him. Meng asked about his reason, and he arrogantly informed him that the person who provoked Helian Li was him, which greatly shocked Meng. Meng tiredly asked him about his choice of hospital to reserve a bed for him. Meanwhile, Wei Ti was shown in front of an elite class student named Zhao Liang, who was the lowest ranked student in the elite class with an actualization quotient of 60%. He asked Wei Tie if he had broken Li Yao's 10 bones so that he could send pictures to Helian Lai. Wei Tie made excuses, claiming he had a sudden stomach ache, possibly due to appendicitis. However, Liang was quite angry to hear this, saying that he thought Wei Tie had potential and was going to speak positively about Wei Tie to Helian Li. Wei Tie made a pitiful face, babbling about his pain and mentioning he was going to visit the doctor. 
Liang kicked Wei Ti hard, stating that Helian Lai wanted to see Li Yao's misery. Then he decided to take care of the matter himself, thinking about Helian Lai. He entered the gym and shouted for Li Yao to show himself. Everyone was confused to see him, as he was out of their league. Besides, Wei Ti had just left and then he entered. Someone muttered about Liang being the genius elite class student with a 60% actualization quotient. They also wondered what Li Yao had done to provoke someone like Wei Ti and Liang. Someone told everyone that Li Yao was the one who encountered Helian Li last night and provoked him. On the other side, Li Yao was listening to all of this. Liang came in front of him, commenting on him being a common person. However, Liang told Li Yao that he didn't understand some combat techniques, so he suggested Li Yao exchange pointers with him, which increased tension around them. They understood that they were going to duel. Around the year 40,000 of the cultivation era, demon beasts ran rampant, as there was a war throughout the land. Ferocity and violence were common human culture. At that time, they believed in the ultimate rule of the jungle, survival of the fittest. Afterwards, private schools like Crimson Nimbus School, which promoted cultivators, didn't forbid their students from dueling. So whenever these students wanted to duel, they used words like exchange of pointers. Besides, the school exhibited medical facilities. In these facilities, there were many miracle medicines and many grandmasters of the medicine field to bring back students from the brink of death. As long as the students hadn't been beaten to death, they could be recovered. Meanwhile, Li Yao surrendered to Liang as he was from the elite class. Liang arrogantly told him to submit himself and let him break his ten bones. However, before he could complete his sentence, he got chalk dust in his eyes and closed them. While Li Yao asked nonchalantly whether he liked the smell of chalk dust, afterwards he attacked Liang, which made Liang realize Li Yao's strength. He then tried to poke his eyes to induce tears and flush out the magnesium powder. Following that, he opened his eyes slowly while exclaiming to Li Yao that he didn't have any shame in using magnesium powder on him. He also added that his greatest weapons weren't his arms, but his legs, and rushed towards him. Liang had used the most powerful technique from the 13 forces of the war beast, the treading tiger stride, and kicked him in the middle. However, his attacks backfired as Li Yao seemed to hide some weight in his clothes, which tackled his knees. Liang started to whine in pain. Meanwhile, Li Yao had attacked him with weight and picked it up, which scared Liang about Li Yao's motives. Before he could attack Liang, Meng interrupted, trying to calm him down while informing him that he shouldn't go to such an extent with Liang as they were schoolmates. Li Yao put down the weight and picked up another one, commenting that now he had picked smaller ones this time. With a scared expression, Liang informed him that he was sent by Helian Lia. However, Li Yao was still unfazed by this information and was about to attack him with the weight, which made him tremble in fear. Afterwards, it was shown that the doctor predicted that Liang had a fracture, which would heal in a few days, but the process might be a little painful. Meanwhile, Li Yao was shown with Meng while people around them murmured about them. Sensing his curiosity, Li Yao offered Meng to ask him any question before the teacher took him away. Meng expressed his confusion regarding Li Yao's sudden power boost. Li Yao made excuses, saying he was practicing a very powerful cultivation technique. Before its completion, his body would be weak. However, he had completed the initial stage, and his body strength had increased. This information left Meng in awe. It seemed that powerful cultivators could make any weakling expose their battle secrets. Besides, it seemed like the Federation had unwritten forbidden rules not to pry into other combat skills and techniques. In this way, society was based on these principles. Meanwhile, Meng asked about his reason for hitting Liang brutally. He thought Li Yao breaking Liang's left kneecap was a bit much. He also added that Li Yao looked like a bloodthirsty monster when he hit Liang with that barbell. Li Yao answered that it was a necessary course of action because Helian Li held a lot of clout at the school, and Liang was the first one who would come after him. He added that Liang was the dead last of the elite class, and even if he had defeated him, they would definitely come to harass him. He continued, saying that it didn't matter how well he could fight because he couldn't keep up if they came after him one by one, so it was necessary that everyone could see what happened to him while hearing Liang's screams. Now they could think twice before coming to him. Then he seriously said to his friend that Meng knew about his origin of being born in a trash heap. Once he had seen two people fighting over half a bag of meat buns, which resulted in two deaths. He knew how to deal with troubles after growing up in this kind of world. At that, Meng still tried to protest, but Li Yao continued, saying that raised in such an environment, he had been taught two things. First, beat their threat to the brink of their life, then negotiate with them. On the other hand, if he would negotiate first, then he would like to offer his head for them to chop off. Then he added that Liang said to him the first thing to beg for mercy and let him break his ten bones. He didn't have want any of these options in this situation. Then what choice was he left with besides fighting? Subsequently, Meng commented that he remembered once Li Yao told him his nickname in the trash graveyard, which was Vulture. He didn't believe him at that time, but now he did. 
With a thoughtful expression, Li Yao said that he was ten times crazier and fiercer at that time compared to now. He added that when he met his foster father, he taught Li Yao to be a little restrained and how to blend in society. Now he was dead, and Li Yao didn't have any restraint, so he didn't have a choice but to follow his vulture instinct. Meng remarked that he understood Li Yao's situation, but now people would start to think that he became arrogant over little success. At that, he arrogantly answered that he was arrogant. He started to say that people like themselves who lived in a trash graveyard and searched for treasure there didn't know when they could find any treasure in the trash heap or get blasted by the spirit energy. People like them needed to be experts in arrogance the moment they got power. They didn't know when they would die, so if they could get 100% arrogant, they wouldn't stop at 90. Having power and keeping a low profile was not their thing. It was like winning a lottery and not spending it on a lavish life. Instead, one could deposit money in the bank and have an accident after it. So in this way, injustice would haunt him even in the afterlife. At that, Meng understood his reason for arrogance but asked about his plan when Helian Li would be using his family influence to get Li Yao out of school. Afterwards, an old man named Sun Biao was shown. He was 150 years old and had taught combat skills for 72 years. Now he was the manager of the warehouse. However, he was also the person who had discovered Peng Hai and was considered a martial artist expert. He held respect around the school, even from the headmaster. Meanwhile, Li Yao looked at Sun Biao and thought he was the person who discovered Peng Hai. Then he turned to Meng. Meng asked as he said earlier that he needed to beat the person in order to negotiate. What if he couldn't beat them? Li Yao nonchalantly said that if they couldn't beat them, they had to run. If they couldn't run, they had to endure. And if they couldn't do it either, they had to die. After saying that, he walked past Sun Biao, who was looking at him with intensity. While he was thinking about Sun Biao's motive, Sun Biao commented that it was a good move for him to use chalk dust. He arrogantly tried to say that it was Jim Chalk, which was the reason for his winning the battle. Sun Biao said that if it were him, he would throw iron shavings from the sandbags so that they would enter his eyes before he could notice it and lose his sight. Li Yao retorted that he would scatter iron nails on the floor so that Liang would injure his feet, causing him to be immobile. In this way, he would need only a few seconds to finish him off. Sun Biao advised him to have things like iron nails and iron shavings in his sandbags every time in order to be prepared for battle as a combat specialist. He should keep them on his person in his shower. He also added that Li Yao went into fights without any basic knowledge. Annoyingly, Li Yao thought that Sun Biao was a shameless person. Unfazed by his expression, Sun Biao commented that the number of people who chad combat skills was decreasing in the recent generation so he could see potential in Li Yao. After that, he invited him to have a little chat at his place. Afterwards, Li Yao started following him. After a while, Li Yao realized that no matter how fast he ran, he always lagged behind five meters from Sun Biao. He halted his movement to realize that Sun Biao might be using some high-level foot technique or spatial cultivation technique. After observing his surroundings, he concluded that it wasn't like Sun Biao was walking fast. Instead, he was walking slowly, so he should just follow behind obediently. After a while, they entered a gym. First and foremost, Sun Biao asked him to accept his apology, which left him baffled. He tried to move Sun Biao from his position, but he couldn't do it. On the other side, Sun Biao continued, saying that although Li Yao was not outstanding in combat skill, he had potential and battle experience, which made him worth nurturing, which was also the purpose of the school. He added that the school couldn't discover his talent, which was their failure as educators, so he apologized on behalf of the school. Reality struck Li Yao that it was the form of the true teacher who undoubtedly discovered the talent of Peng Hai. Meanwhile, Sun Biao asked whether he had heard about the Federation's Youth Limit Challenge. He further elaborated that the Federation Youth Limit Challenge was the joint event hosted by the nine elite universities and the Federal Army. It was a nationwide annual competition held to hunt down youth geniuses. That was the reason it was held two months prior to the university's entrance exams. This was a Federation-old traditional competition, which was divided into several hundreds of simultaneously held competitions. It was rumored to say that every individual competition was held on an inescapable island. In this way, the competitors needed to survive five days on the island while fighting several beasts released by the military. Besides this survival task, they would face several other tasks known as 100% complete simulations of true combat. There was also a chance of recruiting by the nine elite universities upon victory. In this way, they didn't need to take entrance exams. Moreover, even a person without outstanding performance also had a chance of recruiting as long as they displayed excellence in the hundred or competition. That was a reason many third-year students participated in this competition, and Li Yao was not an exception. At the end, he said that it wasn't like anyone could participate in such an important competition. 
The organization would send a number of admission tickets to the important high schools based on their strength and rank. Therefore, Crimson Nimbus School had received its ticket. He further explained that the competition would be held in the upcoming 40 days in the area of District 0571, the district their school was held in. 3,000 elite universities would be participating in the competition. So their school was going to compete in a competition in which every third year could participate and which would determine the allocation of 10 admission tickets. At the end, he seriously advised Li Yao that even though he had invited some trouble for himself, if he could win the ticket, Healy and Lai wouldn't touch him. Li Yao commented about thousands of third years participating in the competition and winning a ticket meaning he would have to be in the top 10. He pondered about the top 20 students who were considered geniuses of the school, having an actualization quotient above 65%, while Li Yao had an actualization quotient of 58%. While facing the weakest student of the elite class, he had won by chance. There was a chance of failing if they were prepared before. He wondered how he could face students with actualization above 65% and win, especially within a month. However, his thought process was interrupted by Sun Biao, who expressed that Li Yao didn't have a chance to come in the top 50 with his current ability, but it couldn't be said if he would be trained there for a month. It made Li Yao excited to realize that Sun Biao wanted to train him personally. Sun Biao started to laugh, saying that he was bored to death to stay at the warehouse, so it wasn't like every day he would find a toy like Li Yao. Then he turned serious and told him to look at the hellish schedule he had planned for him. Afterwards, he opened his projector and showed him the schedule in which he needed to wake up at 4 a.m. and warm up with 20,000 long-distance running. At 5.15, he needed to have circuit training for half an hour, in which he needed to do 500 kilograms half squats. At 6, he needed to have breakfast while studying the military's 13 of the war beasts. And the schedule went on like this. After showing it to Li Yao, he asked whether he liked to give up. He added that he didn't need to shy away, because many cultivators give up halfway because of the difficulty of training program. At that, he commented that the training seemed normal to him. He thought about the training he had gone through as Wu Yaming, in which he was broken and fixed many times before being promoted to forge workers. He told Sun Biao that it was the planning of the normal high school standard and had nothing special about it. Sun Biao commented about Li Yao being arrogant. He added that he put great effort into making this plan. Besides, many cultivation geniuses were afraid of this plan, while he dismissed it like it was nothing. At the end, he angrily said that Li Yao didn't give importance to this training plan. Suddenly, he nervously realized that he shouldn't take the brutal training of the ancient guild from 40,000 years as the normal standard. As it seemed like the agony of this training took the lives of hundreds of thousands of smelting guild members. Besides this, the hundred smelting guild was milder compared to harsher guilds, which took the lives of thousands of guild members. Not to mention the demonic cultivation guild sacrificed thousands of weaklings in order to get one stronger individual. After thinking this, he said to Sun Biao that he would take a closer look at his training program, which seemed terrifying to him, and he didn't think he could complete it. It satisfied Sun Biao, and he threw the training clothes to him while ordering him to perform ten full squats. At that, he arrogantly thought that right now his brutal strength was so high that he would leave Sun Biao astonished with it. He decided to take 300 kilos of weight for the squat. He informed Sun Biao, to which he replied that he was going to regret it later. He arrogantly thought that there was nothing to regret at all because he could do 20 squats with this weight in one breath. However, when he started, it felt like he was crushed by a mountain. After a while, he collapsed. Then Sun Biao informed him that this set of clothes was called Give Up, as it was an artifact from many years ago. It held many magical abilities, one of which was the creation of a gravitational field. It meant the weight of his body was 200 kilograms. However, Li Yao started to push the weight upward while thinking that, in his grand dream, he was tortured brutally for a decade, so Sun Biao's method was not going to stop him. However, afterward, he collapsed again. Again, Sun Biao started to explain the second magical ability of the give-up suit, which released powerful electrical current to help him remodel his body cells into stronger ones. After that, he added that this was a great training suit dreamed by many. However, having a little pain was only a side effect, and he hoped that Li Yao could manage it. With great pain, Li Yao answered affirmatively but was feeling quite hot. Suddenly, when the feelings vanished, they were replaced with bone-freezing cold feelings. This happened three times before it faded away. Following that, Li Yao's acupoints were bombarded by the electrical current again, and his body started to spasm uncontrollably. Meanwhile, he was suffering from the side effects of the suit. Sun Biao explained the final magical ability of the give-up suit, which is attached to the deepest part of his consciousness through an illusionary attack. It helped to speed up cultivation proceedings while deepening his mind. At the end, he boringly said that this suit was not fit for him, so he should just say, I give up, and it would automatically come off. 
However, on the other side, Li Yao exclaimed that he would never give up and completed his second squat. Meanwhile, Sun Biao informed him that he had eight remaining squats. After taking 10 squats, he collapsed on the floor. Sun Biao asked about his well-being. He answered tiredly that he was just taking a short break in order to complete the other nine sets. However, Sun Biao urged him to give up as the suit was not made for him. Besides, he thought that he wouldn't be able to complete 10 sets of squats. At that, he thought that this suit was not named Give Up because of the great gravity, electrical current, or the illusionist attack. However, it was named because when a person said give up, they wouldn't have any courage to put it on again. Meanwhile, he also thought that these clothes were torturing him. Even if he tried to complete the remaining nine sets, there was a chance that he would break in the middle of it and say that he gave up. He was about to say he gave up, but suddenly he stopped his words. He realized that these clothes were not made for ordinary people. He wondered whether he was an ordinary person. He thought that an ordinary person wouldn't hold the memory of his past life. He again asked himself whether an ordinary person would survive the attack of a powerful 40,000-year-old cultivator. He thought further that these things apply to an extraordinary person. Suddenly, he opened his eyes and with determination, he asked permission to listen to music from Sun Biao, to which he agreed. Then he started listening to the music while saying that he wasn't a normal person, so he was not going to give up. At the end, he began his squats again. Meanwhile, Sun Biao was thinking while witnessing Li Yao's determination that he was just like Peng Hai. Afterwards, it was shown that Si Jiaxue was on a video call with Sun Biao. She thanked him for taking Li Yao under his wings. He answered that she went to his father to help Sun Biao, so he returned the favor. However, he asked about the relationship between them as she asked for a favor in order to help Li Yao. She answered that they didn't have anything going between them while telling him the incident about her asking Li Yao to repair her crystal processor. She added that it was the incident which led Halian Li to follow Li Yao, and she didn't want him to be beaten because of her. However, Sun Biao expressed his thought that she might fancy him, to which she declined in a bored tone. But he insisted, saying that she had chosen a fine piece. Meanwhile, he heard that Li Yao started the seventh set of squats. On the other hand, Sun Biao wondered whether he would really complete ten sets of squats while wearing the give-up suit. Afterwards, he got a video call from Peng Hai, who asked him if he knew someone, a fresh graduate from Crimson Nimbus School, who had the monstrous ability. Sun Biao set his request aside and asked whether Peng Hai remembered the give-up suit which was specially designed for him. He nervously answered that he couldn't forget such a troublesome artifact. Peng Hai added that it was expected from Sun Biao, who had the title of Degenerate of the Cultivator to design such a suit. At that, Sun Biao informed him that after Peng Hai had graduated from the school, he had tossed the suit in the corner. However, recently, a student had worn it. This information shocked Peng Hai first. Then he asked how could he let someone wear this torturous artifact. Sun Biao responded that he wanted to let down Li Yao's arrogance. But in response, Li Yao didn't give up. He even wanted more once he got a taste of it. At that, Peng Hai commented that he didn't know Crimson Nimbus had a prodigy. However, Sun Biao rejected his statement by saying that Li Yao wasn't a prodigy, which stunned him. Sun Biao explained that when Peng Hai wore that suit, he was only 14 years old with an actualization quotient of 100%. In order to overcome this suit's side effects, one needed to have a stronger body and mind to connect the essence of heaven and earth into their body. He informed him about Li Yao, that he was 18 with an actualization quotient of 60%. He was resisting the suit with his physical and mental fortitude like a monster. A person like Peng Hai was a rare prodigy, but someone like Li Yao could only be described as a monster. This information piqued Peng's interest, and he asked for a video of Li Yao from his teacher. Sun Biao answered that he would send him a recent video in which Li Yao displayed his situational awareness and tactics in battle. At last, he added that it might infruit Peng Hai, but Li Yao was more suitable to inherit his title of degenerate cultivator instead of Peng Hai. Afterwards, Peng was stunned to see that video of Li Yao's fight. While Sun Biao added that he didn't know which fresh graduate Peng Hai was looking to buy, the only monster he knew was Li Yao. He also asked whether Peng Hai would like to come there and chat with him. At that, Peng Hai arrogantly added that he didn't need to come there as he was going to work with him the following night, in which he could chat with him. Meanwhile, Li Yao was shown finally completing his ten sets of squats. Afterwards, he ate an energy ball which was quite spicy. Sun Biao came and asked about his well-being. He answered that he was feeling great. Then he took off his suit and was about to leave. But Sun Biao interjected that he should remember that today was just the teaser and he should be ready for real training. At that, he answered that he would be there tomorrow. However, Sun Biao remarked that he might not wake up from bed tomorrow morning. The following night, Li Yao was ready to fight with Peng Hai. He thought that even though that give up suit was torturous, but as compared to it, him surviving the attack of Peng Hai for three minutes won't be a problem for him.
When he entered the gym, he was startled to see the snickering faces of Zhao and Peng Hai. Zhao asked whether he liked to have a meal before the fight. Peng Hai also added that he would be given a drug-soaking bath and a massage afterwards. At that, he felt something fishy and asked about their plot. They nervously answered that they weren't planning anything. They just wanted him to be in the best shape so that they could spar for five minutes, which stupefied him. He protested that they needed to fight for three minutes. However, he stopped when Peng Hai offered him 20 grand for a five-minute spar. Meanwhile, on the surface, about a dozen kilometers away from the hero, around an eastern district, Helian Li was bound to a torture machine in the basement of the lavish mansion. In front of him, a video of Li Yao fighting with Liang was shown. While being tortured, he apologized to his father for losing face while causing trouble. However, it infuriated his father who kicked him while informing him that he was not being punished for causing trouble, but for failing while causing trouble. He added that a lion must use his full might while facing a rabbit. He should use his best pawn even if he was facing someone from the common class. Add that Helian Lai understood, while saying that he won't underestimate his opponent again. At that, his father advised him to keep a low profile while planning for the long term, because Sun Biao had taken Li Yao under his wings. He protested that as a member of the board of directors, his father didn't need to fear Sun Biao. He added that even though Sun Biao was a great cultivator, he had only 1% of his power left due to some injury. Besides, he was too old so they didn't need to fear him. His father responded that even if a cultivator had only 1% of his strength left, he was a cultivator at the end, so they shouldn't underestimate him. Besides, Sun Biao asked him to give him one month's time, to which he agreed. At that, Helian Li agreed to wait for one month. The following day, some girls were discussing the current affair of the school, which revolved around Helian Lai and Li Yao. One said to another that Li Yao provoked Helian Li, which resulted in Helian Lai torturing him to the extent that he didn't resemble a human being. She also added that Helian Li had kidnapped and tortured Li Yao at the warehouse. She was passing by that warehouse and heard a loud scream from it, which scared her to the core. Then they spotted Li Yao nearby and were stunned to see him beaten up so badly. Another added that his injury was so bad that he was shaking uncontrollably. Meanwhile, Meng came with a large amount of snacks for him. He asked him whether it was true that he was getting trained by Sun Biao, or whether they were lackeys of Helian Lai who had beaten him. Li Yao tiredly answered that according to his state, he would prefer a beating from Helian Lai. Meanwhile, Sun Biao was having a video call with Peng Hai. Sun Biao remarked about Li Yao that his body wasn't human as he had raised his give-up suit gravitational by pulling a 400 kilograms weight within the training for seven days. He also added that Li Yao didn't halt his training even after the intensity increased to 20%. Then he asked about Peng Hai's end of the training. Peng Hai informed him that they had fought for 10 minutes. He was using only 3% of his strength, but there were also times in which Li Yao also struck him. However, he had managed to control his strength during that training. After 13 days of special training, Sun Biao informed Peng Hai that Li Yao managed to do squats with a 500 kilograms weight. He also increased his actualization quotient by 4%. Sun Biao asked about the reason for Peng Hai's silence. He responded that Li Yao managed to punch him in the stomach, which raised a round of laughter from Sun Biao. While laughing, Sun Biao taunted him that he was struck by an ordinary person. Peng Hai clarified that Peng Hai had suppressed his strength by only 3%, which meant his hearing, sight, and other senses were also suppressed by 3%. But he planned to increase it by 1%. Sun Biao asked about his strength training. Peng Hai replied that he didn't care about it, as he was going to have fun first. Sun Biao added that Li Yao had pushed the limits of the suit to its highest, but Li Yao endured it all by sheer force. Every time he gritted his teeth during training, it made Sun Biao afraid. He considered taking his blood for analysis, which confused Peng Hai. Sun Biao expressed his doubt that Li Yao might be sharing blood with some beasts. After a few days, finally, the final day of the training had arrived. On that day, as usual, Sun Biao was having a video call with Peng Hai. Peng Hai asked about Li Yao's status as the fighting hours of the intense battle were about to begin in a few hours. Thousands of students were participating to obtain 10 tickets. Sun Biao showed his hesitance because he thought that Li Yao had the capability to explode the whole school. He imagined that the moment Li Yao was going to battle, he was going to eat his opponents. On the 12th of April, it was the day of the annual hours of the intense battle. On that day, students had the day off as the school became the battlefield for the third year, fighting a bloody battle for winning the youth limited mission tickets. For this competition, a lottery would select 10 seated competitors out of the third years, and each of them would carry one ticket. They could disperse and hide within the school grounds as far as they could without leaving the school ground. On the other side, other students could use any weapon or strategy they found on the school ground in order to obtain tickets from those seated students. In order to locate the tickets, the tickets were placed inside an artifact box. It would send energy to the processor held by each student to notify their location. 
This would prevent seated students from hiding in some dark corner of the school. The battle would start at 10 a.m. and end at 3 p.m. After five hours, the students who had the tickets would enter into the youth limit challenge. At 8.45, numerous Puji critters filled the sky. Puji critters, also known as flying piglet eyes, were artificially created demon beasts. They were created by crossbreeding experts from the demonic guild. Their purpose was to transmit everything they could see through crystal camera chips installed in their bodies. In the first VIP lounge, thousands of Puji critters positioned themselves in every nook of the school ground. Moreover, giant screens were placed in three VIP lounges, broadcasting thousands of surveillance feeds in real time. In the second VIP lounge, teachers and elite students from various sister schools would spectate the competition. Such events were a common occurrence for these schools. Similarly, Crimson Nimbus would also send their elite students and staff to those schools when they held their own admissions ticket competition. In the third VIP lounge, in the headmaster's office, the board of directors and the school administration department were present. Around one man, the important men of the school, the higher board of directors gathered. Among them was a refined and scholarly middle-aged man named Zhao Yin, a building cultivator at the foundation stage. He was the supervisor of the school's administration. Zhao began his speech by stating that the school was nurturing great talent in its recent batch, giving examples of Helian Lai and Si Jiaxue. He looked at one of the board of directors and referred to him as the father of Helian Lai. Helian Ba humbly acknowledged that Zhao remembered his not-so-talented son. Zhao emphasized that he would remember anyone with talent, as the school's future depended on them. Then, checking the time, he noted that it was 9 a.m., and the intense battle was about to start. At that moment, a clear musical bell rang throughout the school, and thousands of bloodthirsty third years emerged from every corner, each looking at their Micron crystal processor. After a while, they located the tickets and found four of them around them. Everyone gathered around a student to snatch the ticket from him. Around the school grounds, several dozens of flying shuttles were patrolling the area in case of emergency. The school had hired temporary doctors, nurses, and spiritual healers from nearby hospitals to board these shuttles. Meanwhile, in the elite classroom, some students sat leisurely, believing that the battle wouldn't be decided until 3 p.m., so they shouldn't rush. Another student chimed in that there was no chance for the students to keep the tickets until 3 p.m. Furthermore, the school also set several rewards and incentives for the students who kept the tickets for more than five minutes. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to hold it longer. Numerous students fought for the ticket, and it kept changing hands from time to time. Someone in the VIP lounge commented about a student who had potential to be in the elite class, but couldn't make it because of his weak punch. Another remarked about Crimson Nimbus School having ex-military combat experts, which could be seen in the fighting style of the students. Someone from another corner complained about a sleeping person named Da Dong, saying he was making a fuss about coming over. Yet now they were there, and he was sleeping. It was shown that he was Jeng, who boringly replied that the one he wanted to watch hadn't appeared yet. The girl asked whether he wanted to see Hillian Lai and see Jiaxue, but he declined her claim, remarking that he didn't want to see stronger but fiercer ones. After a few hours at 12 p.m., it was shown that the medical crew was in action as half of the students were badly beaten and exhausted due to the intense battle and dropped out due to injuries. Now the elite class emerged from their classes, all fit and strong, ready to fight. Two hours ago, it was shown that all 10 tickets had fallen into the hands of the elite class, with Si Jiaxue and Halian Lai securing their tickets within a minute. No one could come after them. Meanwhile, Zhao commented that it had been three to five years since the school had produced such fine students. Meanwhile, Zheng was shown sleeping while whining about the wastage of his morning. However, Li Yao was shown exercising in his training gym. Sun Biao told him that he could remove his suit and leave now. He answered that there was no need for it and came out from the gym. When he appeared, someone questioned why Li Yao appeared late, suggesting that every strong and genius of the school had already appeared. So who could Li Yao be? Someone commented that he might have given up, which is why he appeared late. After looking at Li Yao, Jang stood up from his place. His girlfriend asked whether Li Yao was better than Helian Li. At that, Jang replied that Helian Li was stronger than Li Yao, but he would choose to fight Helian Lai than him. The girl asked about his reason for saying something like this. He replied that it was because they were the same kind of person. People in the VIP lounges looked at Li Yao and wondered about his motives, as there was no one else in the second cafeteria. Meanwhile, Li Yao was shown with a bunch of snacks in his hands. Someone commented that they thought Li Yao might be a secret weapon of the school, but he was probably a glutton. On the other hand, some students outside the competition noticed Li Yao in full health. One of them commented that he might be hiding somewhere, which is why he was in good health. Then they shouted for him to be careful, as he might be attacked by elite class students. Li Yao thanked them and leisurely went in the direction they had pointed out, leaving them baffled. He looked at his microcrystal watch and checked the nearby ticket location. 
he found a nearby ticket held by Na Lan Ying, who was ranked 21st in the elite class with a 65% actualization quotient. She got the ticket with mere luck. She thought that all of the students of her class gave up against CG Axue and Helian Li, resulting in their elimination, while the remaining students went to other areas to get tickets. Suddenly, she sensed someone and looked in that direction to find Li Yao there. She thought it was just Li Yao, but didn't understand her feelings of caution towards him. She felt like she was going to face demon beasts to which she didn't dare to fight back. When he stepped forward towards her, she was completely petrified and didn't understand the reason behind it. The spectators were confused by Lan Ying not fighting back against Li Yao. Someone commented that she might think it was beneath her to fight with someone like Li Yao. Meanwhile, Li Yao approached Lan Ying, and she felt like a beast was approaching her. He asked about Healy and Li's location, and she pointed towards where he was. He thanked her and moved away from her. On the other hand, she felt like she had escaped death. Afterwards, he faced four ticket holders whom he had terrified but didn't do anything. After that, he went towards the sports field. Meanwhile, people were astonished to see the frightened behavior of the students towards Li Yao. Before he could get to Healy and Lai, Lian confronted him, claiming that he remembered everything Li Yao had done to him. He also added that he had endured the pain of intense training during this month in order to defeat him, which Li Yao couldn't imagine. In this month, he had ranked up to 33 from 41. Besides, Li Yao was going to witness his practice technique called Treading Tiger Strike 3 Murdering Hit Combo. Li Yao nonchalantly said that Liang was saying so much as if it was a debate competition while he didn't have tickets. It infuriated Liang, and he was about to attack Li Yao. However, Li Yao was faster, and he had crushed the ears of Liang as well as knocked him out. Everyone was astonished to witness Li Yao's military killing technique called the 13 Forces of the War Beast Treading Tiger, Strike 7 Hit Murdering Combo. Meanwhile, Zheng had a satisfied expression after witnessing it. There were only eight minutes left before the end of the competition. On his way, Li Yao encountered some students who praised him for getting so much stronger in just one month. Then they told him that they were not on the same level as Liang and were in the top 20. They further warned him that he didn't stand a chance against them, so he should leave them alone, and he looked for someone else's ticket. Li Yao checked his watch and concluded that all three of them had the tickets. They said that they always hovered around the top 20 of their class. So in order to increase their chances, they joined forces. Moreover, they had defeated several students in the top 15 in order to get three tickets. The combo technique they had practiced for a year was perfect for their plan. They said that with their united force, they didn't even fear Li Yao. Meanwhile, Li Yao checked the location of other tickets and thought that with only seven minutes left, the other ticket holders were very far away. He analyzed that these three were the strongest and could block any path of his attack. He addressed Healy and Lai in his mind that they were going to meet each other in the youth limit challenge to settle things between them. At that moment, he took off his suit and exclaimed that these three were going to curse their bad luck. Meanwhile, spectators were amazed to see that he was fun to fight one on three. One of them commented that even though he had defeated Liang in one move, these three were stronger than Liang. It would be terrible to face these three together. On the other hand, Li Yao neatly folded his training suit to the side and rushed towards his opponents with the technique of tiger treading strike. All three of them attacked him at once and were shocked to see that he didn't cry out in pain. They were amazed by his physical resistance. One of them recognized it as the high-class energy dispersion technique. It could be learned through repeated attacks on someone's body. One of them shouted that Li Yao was a monster and had the equal strength of Healy and Lai. Everyone was shocked to see that the encirclement made by the three elite class students was broken by one common class student using only brute force. While he was beating these students, they realized that his technique was not subtle. Every move was predictable, but his punches were strong, showcasing his fighting ability. Then, one by one, they formed the formation. This was a technique they had been practicing for a month in case they faced Healy and Lai. Everyone was surprised to see that they had used this technique against a common class student. This strategy was making Li Yao frustrated. Meanwhile, witnessing everything, the elite class's teacher commented that his students might not be the strongest ones, but they were the most intelligent and clear-minded. That was the reason their strategy could make even Healy and Lai struggle against them, while he wondered whether Li Yao could break it. Only half a minute was left, and people were wondering whether Li Yao could change his situation or not. Each second was passing slowly. One by one, he was going against each of his opponents. Only a few seconds remained as two of his opponents had almost caught Li Yao. However, he managed to get out of their grip, but meanwhile, the time was over. They were happy to have won. However, when they checked their tickets, two of them had the tickets, but one ticket was held by Li Yao, which shocked the remaining student. Li Yao took out the ticket from its box, and after reading the description, he concluded that he had to go to Devil Dragon Island. It was one of the locations of the Youth Limit Challenge. 
Meanwhile, spectators were amazed to see Li Yao holding the ticket because no one noticed when he got it. Zhao praised Li Yao, mentioning that he had the physical body of a body tempering specialist from the Northwest continent. While he had the fingers suited for someone who crafted artifacts, in other words, he had a talent for refining. In their age, they needed multi-talented geniuses, which Li Yao could fulfill. At that moment, someone whispered something in his ear. Meanwhile, Helian Boa said that he hadn't heard Zhao mention something like this before. On the other hand, Zhao asked Helian Boa if Li Yao and Helian Lie had an ongoing conflict. He replied subtly that kids usually fight as it was their way of understanding each other. He added that most of the strongest bonds are created by rivalries and fights. Zhao commented happily that both Helian Li and Li Yao had potential futures ahead of them, so they should drop these small matters. Helian Ba agreed with him on this matter. Then, he turned to Headmaster Zhao and asked about funding for Li Yao, as he had heard that his family circumstances weren't good. He also suggested withdrawing funds from the school and personally giving them to Li Yao as a scholarship in recognition of the performance he displayed that day. Zhao meaningfully remarked about not getting involved in the school matters of Helian Ba, as Li Yao had shown potential. Helian Ba responded that he was just following Zhao's good leadership example, though inside, he was burning with anger toward Li Yao. Meanwhile, at school building number one, Si Jiaxue and Helian Li were shown on the roof. While watching his crystal processor, Helian Li commented about the elimination of stronger students after they had received injuries from both of them. He excitedly expressed his curiosity about the eight other students who would accompany them to Devil Dragon Island. While checking the list, they were shocked to see Li Yao's face. Later, it was shown that Li Yao had boarded the flying shuttle, upon which they were passing over the sea. He witnessed a giant fish swimming at full speed and getting caught in a trap. Li Yao pinched his nose after inhaling the terrible smell. Meanwhile, he witnessed some people hunting down that giant fish monster. After observing it, he concluded that this encirclement hunt was well planned. They had used a net first to exhaust the monster's fish, then they had cut off its tentacles. Finally, they had attacked its wounds, resulting in damaging its brain. Li Yao pondered about the vastness of the world of cultivation. On the other side, people around him were in awe of these cultivators. Li Yao promised himself at that moment that one day he would be a cultivator with a personally crafted high-quality weapon. He would explore the sea and slay demon beasts. Suddenly, he was brought back to reality by the touch of a dream realm in which everything felt real. He planned to record everything he remembered, as Wu Yeming's technique would be a true treasure trove. Even a single shard of memory could provide massive benefits. He gladly thought that it felt like he was hearing the sounds of a treasure trove. Now, he was only one step behind inheriting all of the memories of Wu Yezi. Suddenly, he smelled alcohol and looked beside him, startled to see Jiang standing there, remarking about the beautiful view ahead of them. Li Yao remembered him being a friend of Helian Li, but Jiang clarified by saying that he was more like a food and drink buddy of Helian Li. Li Yao asked about the difference. Jiang explained that Helian Li could call him for anything related to pleasure, like car racing or having a drink together. But when it comes to beating someone whose strength increased in just one month, and who had upgraded his actualization quotient by many points, then it was an overestimation of their friendship. At that, Li Yao asked whether Zheng was there to cause trouble. He responded by asking Li Yao if he knew about the quantity of fine wines the Federation had, about the girls who entered the entertainment industry, and about well-known restaurants. Li Yao annoyingly showed his lack of knowledge. At that, he answered that the Federation had 13,000 time-honored wines, 300,000 restaurants, and 500,000 girls entering the entertainment industry. He continued saying that he was from a rich family and came here for such delicacies like wine, food, and women. Therefore, he didn't have time to cause trouble. Then Li Yao deviously asked if he wasn't here to cause trouble, then perhaps they could team up with Li Yao to work together at Devil Dragon Island. He replied that Li Yao was right about his intention, but it was only one of his objectives as he also wanted to chat with him. As it was said in old cultivation language to plant a seed of karma, Subsequently, Li Yao asked about their expected topic of chat because Zheng was rich and powerful, while Li Yao was poor and shunned. Zheng slyly gave options for their talk, like which university Li Yao should apply to, or what kind of cultivator he should become, considering his skill in artifact repairing. It piqued Li Yao's interest, and he asked about how many types of cultivators there were. Zheng started to explain that before the 40,000th cultivation era, cultivators were not divided into categories. They were usually divided into demon path cultivators or fiend path cultivators. That was because of their different paths of getting spiritual energy. He further explained that during the modern cultivation era, society had divided cultivators into six major categories, with the most common being the battle type cultivator. They displayed the typical image of the cultivator as they flew on swords and slew demon beasts. 
Then Li Yao asked about the remaining five. Zheng continued explaining that the second type was the admin type for those who didn't have stronger spiritual energy but had marvelous computational ability. For example, they could do several million calculations telepathically, predict the direction of events, and process a large amount of information. These kinds of cultivators were most suited for administrative jobs like guild leader or mayor of the city. As Li Yao pondered, he realized there was a huge difference between commanding an army or destroying a mountain with a single punch, as it wasn't necessary for a stronger cultivator to be a good leader. Zheng also added that the highest person in their Star Glory Federation, named Xu Haoran, was the admin type. He had reached the Yuan Ying stage when at the highest of his mental energy. In other words, he was like a crystal processor in human form, who could process 80 million thoughts in a single second. At that, Li Yao commented he wasn't made for this type of cultivation. Then Zheng started to explain about the third type, research type. They were similar to admin type cultivators, as they could process thousands of thoughts in seconds, but they were not well-rounded. They could only concentrate on one subject, thus they usually became teachers, lawyers, or doctors. While witnessing Li Yao's expression, Zheng commented that he shouldn't think any research-type cultivator would be useless. Besides, they could predict the explosion of the star's energy. Moreover, they could predict the combat style of ancient beasts just by looking at their fossils. They also discussed a study named Ancient Beast Combat Emulsion Study and other frightening research. They could even merge a human with a beast, but it was illegal in the Federation, although some illegal areas supported it. To increase his interest, he deadpanned that the person who had invented the fiend virus was also considered a research-type cultivator. With this revelation, Li Yao felt nervous. He thought about the terrific side of research cultivators, as one of them led humanity to the Dark Ages 40,000 years ago. However, he asked Zheng about the fourth type of cultivator. Zheng started to explain about the fourth type of cultivator, which was the creation type. They usually had balanced spiritual and computational energies, their hands should have unrestrained and bold imagination in order to manufacture. They mostly got the job of master refinery. The most expert refiners could create a warship bigger than the moon. For example, they could create a star pulverization cannon which could flatten an entire continent in a single shot. It seemed Li Yao was interested in the creation type but didn't comment about it. On the other hand, Zheng continued to explain the fifth type of cultivator, which was the culture type. They had the highest mental prowess, which they could use to influence any person to suffer in any space and time and to merge them into their mental world. They were usually known as mysterious types whose mental world was a mystery to everyone, no matter how much researchers studied about them. They were most likely musicians, artists, poets, or novelists. Li Yao commented that it seemed like they didn't have combat skills. Zheng clarified that it wasn't true for special cases. He gave the example of a special job called Grand Illusionist. Usually they looked like normal people, but when they exploded, they also pulled others into the world they had created in their mental realm. They literally created the law there, which means they could even control the weather. Not only this, stronger cultivators than them could have difficulty escaping unharmed once trapped inside their realm. Li Yao remarked about the marvelousness of the cultivators. He commented that compared to these cultivators, battle types seemed ordinary. However, Zheng continued to explain about the sixth type, which was the hybrid type. They were usually rare geniuses called jacks of all trades, as they had mixed characteristics of the different types. Moreover, those cultivators who could cross over to other realms were quite rare. When they appeared, every guild wanted them in. After listening to all of this, he thought that he had the potential to become a creation or battle type. But now it was too early to decide, as he should concentrate on the competition. Suddenly, they heard a commotion and looked in that direction. It was the Devil Dragon Island Challenge Competition, Arena Number 571. They didn't understand what was happening until they spotted in the distance a super heavy class crystal battleship with a length of 7,800 meters and a weight of 63 million tons. 300 refinement stage cultivators were there to operate and check the critical stations of the ship. Now, it had turned into an artifact museum. It was created during the rise of the formation of the Federation around 500 years ago. The Federation used literally their entire workforce to create that battleship. During the times of the Great Blood Ocean War, it worked as the flagship of the Federation. At that time, it battled against the East Demon Kingdom. In the end, it even sank deeper into the Far East Demon Emperor's flagship. It struck Wild Heaven only in one blow and came out victorious. It was the war about determining the fate of the Federation. Therefore, they were able to annihilate the Far East Demon Kingdom. Consequently, the victory led the Federation to dominance in the Heaven Origin sect. The path led to their prosperity every day. However, according to legends, Although the Far East Demon Kingdom had been annihilated, their emperor had not. It was said that he was hiding in the depths of the ocean while gathering spirit demon soldiers in order to rise again. 
This was the reason a patch of the ocean became the path where an evil wind blew with maelstrom and fury. It was because the demon emperor was making waves at the bottom of the ocean. Therefore, the Federation had to place the distant expense there, which was once fought in order to protect and now become the tourism monument for the youngsters. It helped to stimulate the thoughts of blood in their minds while strengthening the spirit of the Federation. It was the message that the distant expense would defeat the demon emperor forever and perish evil souls. Suddenly, someone in the setting spotted something in the air. Li Yao witnessed that in front of was the curtain of light spread over students of kilometers in the sky. Following that, the students had seen the Great Blood Ocean War from 500 years ago in the Far East. The Demon Emperor's flagship was created by the skeletons and corpses of hundreds of giant demon beasts from the ocean. It had been catalyzed by the demon technique of decades ago. This flagship was a large skeleton battleship with a length of more than 20 kilometers and a weight extended to 190 million tons. The students were looking at the display of the war when many battleships were trying to hold off the attack from the distant expense. They thought about humanity's larger sacrifice for the sake of humanity. Many other human battleships were going there, making a shield for the distant expense. The demonic flagship and distant battleship had a distance of 500 meters between them, with many battleships separating them. Instead of using its spiritual energy for defense, it used it for offense, driving the propulsion array. Afterward, they destroyed the demonic flagship. Overall, this battle had killed many crew members, as well as cultivators who didn't survive the battle. It resulted in the birth of a powerful nation which belonged to the Federation. The Star Glory Federation's flag had nine stars which represented the nine cultivators who founded the Federation. Besides, the giant dragon represented the human civilization standing against cosmos and stars while aiming to conquer them. After watching the events of the war, everyone started to shout about long-live humanity and the Federation. They also exclaimed about the supremacy of the human race and that no one could beat them. Everyone was intensely watching the warship called Distant Expense, including Li Yao. He thought about distant expenses having to be a monument after its death while forever guarding their nation. He accepted the distant expense to be a gigantic artifact, which was not only guarding them, but also surpassing the rise of the Far East Demon King. With a serious expression, he understood that when one crafted something like distant expense, which became a national treasure, he would become, and recognized, as the true master refiner. At that moment, he was determined to craft something like this, even if he would just participate in the maintenance of it. He knew it would bring him glory. Therefore, he concluded to be such a refiner. During the war, from every direction, anti-gravity ships were gradually rushing towards the docking bays of the distant expense. Without realizing, Li Yao jumped onto distant expenses. He looked at the status of a captain of the ship. His name was Ping Yuan Tao, who was a core formation stage cultivator. He was shown shouting about the destruction of the Wild Heaven ship. According to legends, he entered into the guild as a child. It was the time when the Guild of Heaven origin sector was the paradise for demon beasts. On the other side, humanity was struggling to survive. Meanwhile, cities were governed by the guild. At that time, the Star Glory Federation was founded without being recognized as a nation. Moreover, the nine guilds also established a lax organization for the sake of establishing mutual communication. It was the time when youngsters usually went towards the guild for jobs. The elders of the guild usually asked their purpose for joining. The common answer was seeking glory, women, and riches. Some also wanted to learn hundreds of magical abilities and transformations in order to have ultimate access between heaven and earth. Some wanted immortality, while some wanted to protect their precious ones. When Ping Yuan Tao wanted to join, he told his reason for joining that he wanted to make the Star Glory Federation the strongest human nation in the entire Heaven Origin sect. Everyone was praising Captain Ping's words. Suddenly, Li Yao was interrupted by Zhang, saying that the statue was not going anywhere. They needed to go to the occasion in order to get a place. Li Yao asked about the occasion. Zhang informed Li Yao that before the beginning of the challenge, the nine elite universities held an event called the Interactive Exchange Convention. It was placed outside of the arena in which nine elite universities showed off the nine elites who would directly interact with the exam candidates. So they needed to hurry. They entered into an arena which was surrounded by the lively voices of the students. The entire arena was separated into nine areas. Zheng pushed him toward the Sky Fantasia Academy's booth. Li Yao asked whether this university was stronger than others. At that, Zheng haughtily informed him that he didn't care about the university being the strongest. This university was known to culture-type cultivators. So many beautiful and cultured women would join this university. When they reached there, students were usually listening to music, painting, or engaging in activities related to art. Li Yao was interested in a painting of an octopus. Suddenly, he heard the sound of waves, and the painting came alive in front of him. He saw himself surfing in the sea while a giant octopus was about to attack him. 
He shouted and snapped back to reality. Jang asked whether he understood the fearsome nature of the culture type. He added that even the painter didn't have any intention, besides that the painting was half completed. He asked whether Li Yao would escape from it if it was completed. At that, he let out a sigh of relief. Li Yao admitted in his mind that culture cultivators were truly terrifying, as such a strong illusion was created with a half-completed painting. Jung turned to him while warning him that they shouldn't mess with these culture-type cultivators as they were lunatics, even though most of them were women. Then he pointed toward the guy who was reciting the poem and urged Li Yao that they should go somewhere else as he didn't want to be in the mental realm of the ugly guy. Don't forget to like and comment for the next part. Join our Discord for the name of the book and subscribe for more videos from us.